Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Cayman Heart Fund's first live virtual conference via Zoom webinar, Back to a Normal Rhythm. I'm your host this evening, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Bella Baraja, and I'm the chairperson for the Cayman Heart Fund. I would like to go over a few technical details. Remember, you can click audio settings and choose how you hear us today. The chat feature is going to be disabled, but we as a host may use it to send you any important notices. You're viewing this event today as an attendee. That means that you can see and hear the content being provided, but cannot share your screen, audio, or video with us. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a button for Q&A. After my introduction, each panelist will be talking for 30 minutes, and that will be followed by a five-minute session of question and answers. So please do submit your questions as we go along, and we will answer as many of them as possible live at the end of each speaker session. We have a packed agenda tonight, but before we get started, I just wanted to say a few introduction words. Normally, every March, we would be hosting our live international symposium. Unfortunately, this year we cannot host the event live, but we must be grateful we have the technology and support available to bring us the latest developments of cardiovascular disease topics by renowned experts virtually. The Cayman Heart Fund has been faced with many struggles during the COVID pandemic. On the one hand, we paused our usual awareness and fundraising events. On the other, our community needs could not be placed on hold. And as a matter of fact, some of these needs grew during this time. We faced needing to understand how we could help our community and at times felt frustrated when we could not offer help in the same way we had before. But then we regrouped and decided we needed to adapt and restructure. From the beginning of the pandemic, we, re we reached out to the government and offered our assistance. We put together a list of volunteers to help with multiple key tasks. We helped the operations of the isolation facilities in anywhere from transportation of food to other necessities such as coordinating the nurse on call team for these facility residents. We also continued to operate pursuing the prevention and awareness of cardiovascular diseases by providing AEDs, cardio cardiovascular awareness programs, and funds to families in need. After the Cayman Islands was declared a country with no community transmission of COVID, we regrouped once more, focusing on our return to our regular operations. We celebrated World Heart Day and were fortunate to be supported by many local businesses. Team Nolan, part of our pediatric program, hosted an extremely successful annual beach walk to raise awareness and funds towards the congenital heart disease awareness. Our AED program grew, and we have now partnered with Lifeline to best provide accessible AEDs throughout all districts in key locations. During 2020, we also were blessed to have a new member join our family. Ali, our new coordinator, joined us just as COVID was swooping in, and what an introduction that was. She had to learn the ropes and immediately become an innovator. I must say she has done an amazing job. This job, this year, our board has also experienced growth. Some of our new members are Katie O'Neill, who has been instrumental in this event and all our IT needs, including our website and social media. Mike Scott joined us as treasurer and Charlotte Beals Hart as part of our pediatric chapter. We have also been joined by many volunteers eager to help us give back to the community. All these changes I have just mentioned led us to the title of the conference, Back to the Normal Rhythm. This doesn't mean back to business as usual. It means the new normal. For us to better serve the community, we needed to grow, strive on, and resume our new normal. But I feel most of you are familiar with this, as this applies to all of us, both in our personal and professional lives. And this is the key of being resilient. I would also like to take a moment to thank the people behind the scenes making this event possible. SMU for hosting us, our coordinator, Ali, and board members such as Katie O'Neill, who have played key roles in today's event. And finally, our amazing volunteers, people like Diane Obana, Taryn Stein, and Kevin Wattler, who's logged in from Florida. Before we move on to our speakers, I would like to mention a few logistic details. Please remember, the question and answer is enabled through the entire conference. It can be anonymous. Feel free to submit questions at any time. Do mention who the question is addressed to. The speaker will only answer these questions at the end of their talk and only as many as time permits. If your questions remain unanswered at the end of the conference, we suggest you submit them, but non-anonymously. We can get the answers back to you from the speaker. 
Also, the webinar will be recorded and a video of the event will be made available to panelists and attendees as soon as possible after this event. For those claiming CME, we will provide information at the end of the conference on how to get the electronic diploma. This conference will provide a total of 3.5 CME. Finally, I would like to thank our speakers. These amazing doctors come to us from world-renowned healthcare institutions. These hospitals have always supported the Heart Fund, and a true testament to this is that in spite of all these hurdles we're facing today, they are still here joining us. So now we're ready to introduce our first speaker, and hopefully things will go seamless. Obviously, if anything goes wrong, please allow us some patience and time so that we can bypass these problems. Our first speaker is Dr. Jose Collado. He comes to us from Holy Cross Hospital and his topic will be updates in heart failure with preserved or reduced ejection fraction. As I mentioned, he works at Holy Cross Medical Group Cardiology Associates as a staff physician. He did his residency in internal medicine and cardiology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida, and then went on to do advanced heart failure cardiology in the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He went to medical school in the Dominican Republic, and he is American Board of Internal Medicine Certified, National Board of Echocardiography, and ABIM Cardiovascular Disease. So here to speak to us about heart failure with preserved or reduced ejection fraction, please welcome Dr. Jose Collado. We know that heart failure is a systemic condition with elevated intracardiac pressures, and that there are two subtypes reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction, both of which share a similar mortality. Regarding epidemiology and gaps, it is estimated that by the year 2010, the prevalence of heart failure in the United States will rise up to 8.1 million, which represents a cost close to 70 billion dollars. Despite all the evidence based medicines, a large group of patients are not receiving the medications they need to improve outcomes. In this analysis by Green in 2018, around 10 to 50% of patients were not receiving the appropriate medical therapy, especially in older age, lower blood pressure, more severe functional class, renal insufficiency, and or recent heart failure hospitalization. Choice of medication. First, I want to encourage you to review this in-hospital expert consensus published in June 2019 by the American College of Cardiology, where the main key points I want to emphasize are, number one, to consider doubling the dose of home diuretics upon admission. Number two, calibrate on the second day of admission to, number one, recognize cardiac shock early. Number two, minimize the of stay. Number three, early hospital follow-up after discharge. The first of the three medications we will discuss today is acumetrial valsartan, both in heart breath and in heart breath. As you know, it has a marked improvement in survival and hospitalizations, with a risk reduction of over 20% when compared to ACE. This is in the setting of rare side effects. The composite was mostly driven by readmissions rather than mortality. A frequent question. I usually get is the changes in brain natural effect by biomarkers with this medication. And this is simple. Patients with a transplant will get lower levels of anti B because the intracardiac pressures are diminished. When compared to patients with anti inhibitors, anti B will be higher as nephrolysis, which is not inhibited by BMP, and this is suffering. And then we get to the 
response of tracheobitral valve surgeon it has been doing preserved ejection fraction patients with the famous p value of 0 0.06, just shy of 0 0.05 goal for the composite of hospitalization and death when compared to valve surgeon alone. Despite this, the FDA approved the use of tracheobitral valve surgeon just a month ago, February 16 this year. Selected half failure reserve injection fraction patients. As you can see here, just like in the reduced injection fraction patients, in preserved injection fraction department of failure trial, the outcomes were given mostly by hospitalization rather than by mortality. Second class of medications I want to discuss today are the SDL before injection. This is a diagram I created of the progression of evidence of these medications. Number one, in red on top, around five years ago, the focus was on diabetes with atherosclerotic vascular disease. Number two, in yellow, early 2019, the focus was diabetics with risk factors for atherosclerotic vascular disease, where prevention was actually evidence. Number three, in yellow, since late 2019, we now know this medication works even in non diabetic patients. And please listen to the summary of all these trials. Number one, low risk of hospitalizations for all of these patients. Number two, lower mortality only in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Number three, it prevents progression of kidney disease and heart failure. The mechanism by which these pills improve cardiovascular outcomes is independent of that and seems to be related to the inhibition of this sodium hydrogen exchanger, NHE, which increases mitochondrial calcium and prevents remodeling. That by reclosing specifically also activates M2 microfilm, which seems to inhibit the formation of scar tissue by minimizing fibroblasts. So cardiac consequences are reverse cardiac remodeling. And kidney consequences are kidney reverse remodeling. And the earlier stages the medication started, the more benefits. Now, this trial in July 2020 showed that it is safe to give both SGLT2 inhibitors as well as acubitral barsartan medications. Now, I know a lot of you think of this picture when you hear the terms heart failure preserved rejection fraction randomized clinical trials. And hear me out, there are some positive things we are going to say today. First, let's talk about the guidelines. And notice that it's really important to number one, focus on blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, and coronary artery disease. Also, notice that down here in the 2B area, sternolactone is here just for the hospitalization rate of patients that have good kidney function and normal potassium levels. But let's explore that specific medication. In the TOMCAT trial, international, was performed comparing spironolactone to placebo. It showed low risk for hospitalization with no change in mortality. However, in a subgroup analysis, it was found that patients from the countries of Russia and Georgia, patients that were on the spironolactone arm, did not have a lower blood pressure. The potassium and creatinine levels did not go up, and a metabolite of spermilactone named carminol was not detectable, which suggested these patients were not even getting the medication. But a separate analysis in three divide Russia and Georgia so outcomes were actually significant for both hospitalization and mortality. Next up, let's talk about devices and procedures. First up, the mitral clip. Mitral clip is back to stay in patients with heart failure and moderate to severe secondary mitral irritation who remain symptomatic despite the use of maximum doses of guideline directed medical therapy. Here we see that the outcome was also improvement of both hospitalization and survival with a low risk of complications. Next device I want to discuss is the CardioMax. CardioMax is a portable strap cap, the size of a round cycle, that measures the mean pulmonary arterial pressure remotely. 
It is FDA approved to reduce the risk of hospitalizations in our field of patients. We are currently planting both of these devices, the microchip and the cardiogram. We are called Cross Health. How it works is by sending signals to a special pillow on a daily basis, which information is then reviewed by our heart failure team and medications are adjusted. As you can see here in green, diabetics were the main medications that were changed, that were driving the outcome. And a question that you may ask is, what about the risk of kidney injury? And as you see here, there were no significant kidney injury among groups. Next, let's talk about future directions. So the trials we're currently performing at Holy Cross, including the reduced LAP trial with an interactional shunt device. But there are many exciting things coming up in the heart failure world. Thank you again for having me. I'll be here for questions. Have a good day. Thank you, Dr. Collado. That was a great presentation. Um, we're going to look through what questions have been submitted and um, so that we can ask Dr. Collado to elaborate on some topics. So if anybody has uh, any type of questions, uh, otherwise, Dr. Collado, I was wondering, being that you are a heart failure specialist and most of the people logged in here today, uh, medically speaking, from the profession, would like to know when do we start to refer patients to a heart failure specialist? What are, what, what are the benchmarks? Is it more symptomatic? Is it more um, found in echocardiography incidentally, even in the asymptomatic, or what do you consider an appropriate referral to a heart failure specialist more than a cardiologist? So Dr. Collado uh, just answered, unfortunately his audio is not working, but he says the main reasons are when advanced heart failure is suspected. And this includes intolerance to G GDMT, ventricular arrhythmias, cardiogenic shock, frequent hospitalizations, intractable angina, advanced heart disease of any sort with no other options. All right, great. So we're gonna check one more once more if we have any other questions. So I guess my last question would be, um, if you had a wish list for your heart failure patients of what their medication or pill box would look like, what would you say was on your wish list for your patients? Now that we have all these new drugs introduced to regimens. And Dr. Cordell just answered, he said the four main ones, beta blocker and Tresto SGLT2 inhibitors and spironolactone. All right, excellent. Um, so if you have any other questions for Dr. Collado, even if we pass on to the next topic, please, please feel free to just direct them to him and we'll get the answers to you probably after the conference. So thank you again to Dr. Collado from Holy Cross. Oh, sorry, we have one more question, Dr. Collado. Could you please elaborate on the cardio MIMS? On the, I guess someone wants a bit more of specifics. Um, he's answering that it is an FDA approved device for Medicare patients. So that's applicable for the US and Florida. It's placed via a right heart cath procedure, via the groin usually, to the left main. It's got a very low risk of complications. It left pulmonary artery correction and the device stays there. The main goals of the device are decongestion, so most of the work is after the device is placed. It can be monitored remotely. Provider, uh, well, this requires there's internet access and obviously electricity. All right, and that's, um, so now we are gonna wrap up uh, Dr. Collado and move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker will be Dr. Viviana Navas. Dr. Viviana Navas works at the Cleveland Clinic, Florida. She's gonna be speaking about cardiac amyloidosis. 
She's a board certified cardiologist with Cleveland Clinic Florida's Robert and Suzanne Tomsic Department of Cardiovascular Medicine and the medical director of the heart transplant team. Dr. Navas specializes in advanced heart failure therapies, heart transplant, mechanical circulatory support devices, right heart catheterization, endomyocardial biopsies, cardiomyopathies, pulmonary hypertension, and echocardiography. She earned her medical degree in Bogota, Colombia. Her advanced training included internal medicine residency and cardiology fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Florida, where she was the chief fellow. She also completed a heart failure and transplant fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio. She's a, uh, she's a member of the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, Heart Failure Society of America, and the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. So here is Dr. Viviana Navas from Cleveland Clinic, Florida, speaking on cardiac amyloidosis. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you so much to the Cayman Heart Fund for the invitation, Dr. Bella Baraja and uh, uh, all the organizers of the event. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be part of this. Um, and it's really amazing to be working with Dr. Baraja. We did residency together here at the clinic and with Dr. Collado. He was one of my cardiology fellows when, when uh, he did his cardiology fellowship here at the clinic. So it's always nice to see the people that you've trained with and worked with. Uh, okay, so I'm starting to share my screen and uh, let me move this to presentation mode. Here we go. I'm gonna swap this. Okay, perfect. So um, this is one of my favorite topics. And um, the reason why I decided to give this presentation is because this is, uh, it feels almost like there is a cardiac amyloid epidemic. And uh, the, the good news is that uh, now we have some form of treatment with cardiac, for cardiac amyloid, which makes it extremely important that we recognize the disease uh, so we can uh, treat it appropriately. So I'm gonna start with a common case, something that we see all the time. Uh, so this is a patient that I saw, 76 year old male uh, with a history of a pacemaker that was implanted five years prior to me meeting him. He has a history of diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. Um, he had seen another cardiologist two months prior, everything was normal and good. He had a stress test that was negative, uh, an echocardiogram that showed an ejection fraction of 48% by atrial enlargement and some concentric ventricular hypertrophy. So he presented to the emergency room with abdominal pain, a 20 pound uh, weight loss and uh, inability to walk and feeling extremely short of breath. Uh, he had a long history of numbness in his hands and toes and uh, this was attributed to cervical and lumbar radiculopathy, but uh, he had progressive decrease in ability to walk and shortness of breath. So this was the EKG, you see a sinus rhythm, uh, some Q waves here in the inferior leads, and uh, again, some cues also anterior leads. And this is kind of uh, just a still image of his echocardiogram. He, uh, at this point, his ejection fraction was around 38% with very uh, significant thickness of uh, the walls of the heart. Here you go. You see, this is extremely thick. Um, so the clinical impression that he came with was, well, this is heart failure. He has chronic heart failure, both uh, diastolic and systolic, so preserved that reduced ejection fraction uh, with profound weakness and ambulatory limitation that we thought could be due you know, to heart failure uh, plus some neurological issues. So he was sent to neurology and GI for the symptoms that he was having. Um, then besides the cardiac testing that we had done, that they had been done, this is where most cardiac workups usually stop. So the patient leaves the hospital, he's told or she's told that they, they have some heart failure and we start to try and put them on all the amazing medications that Dr. Collado was just talking about. So that's what's so interesting about amyloid. If you really don't think of looking for it, you will not find it. Uh, there are some very specific clues that we're going to talk about, uh, but what's really important is that if you think about it and you find it, you can help the patient. So what is an amyloid? Um, it's a systemic deposition of abnormal proteins um, in 
different organs that lead to infiltration to the organ and then dysfunction of that organ. Uh, maybe pathologic proteins produced by abnormal cells, abnormal proteins produced by normal cells, or uh, normal proteins that become rearranged. And up to 15% of patients that get a diagnosis of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, what they really have is cardiac amyloid. So this table really helps me to kind of understand amyloid. And uh, I divide it in two big groups. One is the AL, you know, the one that we learned, the one that we know from forever, and the transteritin or ATTR amyloid. And then the ATTR is divided into different types, the uh, mutant type or genetic type where there is a mutation, and then the wild type. So AL is the light chain that we're used to. Uh, usually patients are around 55 years old, 60% are male. Only 30% of AL amyloid involves the heart. Uh, 50 to 80% can be diagnosed by a fat pile biopsy. And it can, those patients either come through the hematologist for the light chains, the cardiologist or the nephrologist. These patients develop chronic kidney disease very often. Then you have the TTR or transteritin, the mutant type, patients are around 50 years old, 80% are male, cardiac involvement is really variable. You usually never diagnose it by fat pal, and the patient can come uh, through a neurologist or a cardiologist depending on their symptoms. The wild type, which is the one that we're really dealing with a lot, uh, Average age, and this is the one, by the way, that everybody used to call senile, but I think there is just so many names that it's better just to call it wild type. So 75-year-olds, 95% are male. They all have cardiac involvement. So this is the one that the cardiologists are really, really used to see. You don't diagnose it by uh, fat pad biopsy, and most of the time, these patients come in through a cardiologist. So different mutations. Depending on the mutation, the uh, transteritin amyloid is going to have either a predominant neurological presentation or cardiac presentation or a mixed presentation. Uh, the most common mutation worldwide is the VAD30-MET, but there is almost 120 mutations for this gene. And this is how, um, kind of how we see amyloid, the changing nature of cardiac amyloidosis and what we were used to diagnosing uh, has changed so much. Mm -hmm. So the one that we were using, uh, used to see, which is the uh, AL amyloid, was the common type with the light chain that we used to see in the 90s and early 2000s. And now most of the amyloid that we diagnose is transteritin. And out of that, transteritin is going to be the wild type. And it's not that the incidence has changed. It's just that now we recognize it and diagnose it more often. So here in the United States, um, again, the most common type is the transteritin. And of that, 48% is wild type, 76-year-old uh, males. And the echocardiogram usually shows uh, intraventricular septum thickness of around two centimeters with an ejection fraction of around 50%. The survival is around 60% uh, at three years. So why is this so important to know? Uh, when a patient gets diagnosed with a cardiomyopathy, you kind of start already thinking about the prognosis. And we know that the patient that gets diagnosed with transteritin amyloid um, has a worse prognosis than any other type of cardiomyopathy that any patient can have. So it's worse than a dilated cardiomyopathy and a hypertensive cardiomyopathy, that any form of valvular heart disease is ischemic cardiomyopathy. So you know that you're already dealing with something that is difficult to treat, difficult to manage, and has very poor prognosis. So uh, the prognosis in uh, in all patients, it's worse than any other cardiomyopathy, and it's especially worse for Afro-Caribbeans with a mutant form. So how do you evaluate amyloid? So obviously, we start with the normal things, which is a physical exam and a good history, and these patients can present with some forms of, of autonomic dysfunction. They can have orthostatic hypotension. Uh, the cardiomyopathy, polyneuropathy, so tingling, numbness, history of carpal tunnel, and there is other symptoms, but these are the three most common uh, signs and symptoms that you can find on these patients. And this is what should really raise a clinical suspicion for amyloidosis. 
So if you see somebody with macroglossia or periorbital purpura, these are very specific for AL, uh, but not that frequent. If you look at an echocardiogram and uh, you see un unexplained left ventricular hypertrophy uh, or a restrictive cardiomyopathy, and you really don't have a good reason for the patient having these like chronic hypertension and stage renal disease, something like that, or some other form of infiltrative cardiomyopathy, think of amyloid. Some red flags are a very uh, consistent, persistent history of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. These patients have had surgeries on both sides, uh, a traumatic biceps tendon ruptures, the, when they've had total knee or hip arthroplasty, uh, spinal stenosis with multiple surgeries, unexplained neuropathic pain, and orthostatic hypotension. Uh, something that is very useful to me when I'm seeing a patient in the hospital or in clinic is I see the EKG and then I see this very low voltage uh, of the QRS and then I go and look at the echocardiogram and I see this very thick wall. So one thing just doesn't go with the other. As soon as you see that, the diagnosis is cardiac amyloid. Nothing else is going to give you that pattern. No other uh, cardiomyopathy. So when you do the echocardiogram, besides just looking at the thickness of the wall uh, of the left ventricle, um, you're gonna see diastolic dysfunction, very advanced, it's usually restrictive. Uh, sometimes you can see pericardial effusion. Early, most patients with amyloid are gonna have a preserved ejection fraction, but with time, it's gonna become uh, systolic dysfunction too. Uh, you're gonna see increased by ventricular wall thickness. The intraatrial septum is also thick, the valves are thick, and both uh, atriums are extremely enlarged because the filling pressures on both sides are so very high that both atriums really dilate. So the thing with just looking at the echocardiogram is that it's almost impossible to differentiate between amyloid and some other forms of uh, you know, cardiomyopathies that cause uh, thickness of the muscle of the heart. Um, Everybody talks about the speckle pattern, and yeah, you kind of see it sometimes, but not always. So for example, this is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a, a patient with hypertension and renal failure who developed hypertrophy. This is a patient with a lysosomal storage disease, and this is our amyloid. So as you can see, just by the images, it's really not uh, easy to tell. So that's why, uh, by just pure echocardiography, we can perform something called speckle tracking echocardiography, which is uh, just this way of looking at the uh, movement and distensibility of different areas of the uh, ventricle. And really what you look for is this pattern here that's called cherry on top, where you see that the apex of the heart is spare from the amyloid. And uh, you see just this redness here, uh, and uh, everything else is very decreased. Basically, the, the, the movement and the compliance of the ventricle is very restricted. You can also perform a cardiac MRI, and there is a very specific pattern of uh, amyloidosis where you see enhancement kind of in the mid wall. Plus, it tells you, you know, how thick the walls really are and how dilated the, the uh, um, atriums are. And then when you've tried all the imaging, uh, you know, forms of diagnosis, but you still have a question or you uh, don't have a, def a definitive diagnosis of amyloid, uh, we can always perform an endomyocardial biopsy. And in some patients it's extremely useful because again, like I said, once you find that the patient has amyloid, um, then you can start some specific forms of treatment. So this is us just performing a biopsy here. We go from the right side of the neck with this is called a biotone. Uh, we cross the tricuspid valve and go into the right ventricle. And we take little pieces from the interventricular septum from the right side of the heart. We usually take, I don't know, between three and five pieces. And then we send them to pathology and then the pathology uh, do Congo red stain. And then uh, you see, you know, the by refringent light here, and that's diagnostic for amyloid. Now, there is this new uh, imaging modality that's a nuclear type of test that's called TC99 pyrophosphate. We call it PYP scan. So this is a nuclear study 
where you see uh, the uptake of of the uh, the radio, radio label, you know, contrast um, in the heart and then in the ribs. And then basically the diagnosis of transteritin amyloid is made when the uptake of the heart is higher than the uptake that happens in the rib cage. So anything above grade two, it's diagnostic of uh, TTR amyloid. It's very sensitive and it is very specific. So once you have the diagnosis of TTR amyloid, it's always good to send the patient for genetic testing because it's always um, important to differentiate between the hereditary and the wild type. And the reason why that's important is because the hereditary, you have to test other family members because it's uh, inherited in an autosomal dominant way. So you have to see if any other uh, pay, uh, people in their family has it. So for AL amyloid, this is not something that the cardiologist does alone. Even if there is cardiac involvement, we really rely on the, our hematologist for this. Um, but the part that the cardiologist manage is um, important to know what it is that you're doing. So the treatment of heart failure in patients with amyloidosis is different from the common therapy that we use for patients with either diastolic or systolic heart failure. And the reason for that is because the, physio the pathophysiology of amyloidosis is very different from any other form of uh, heart failure. So at the very beginning, there is a normal to very small left ventricular cavity that has impaired feeling secondary to decreased compliance. So these are ventricles that are stiff and thick and they don't relax. So very, very volume sensitive. Then as the disease advances, the, the ejection fraction can decrease, but even with decrease of the ejection fraction, the ventricle never really dilates. So you continue to have a small ventricle. Now it's not having good systolic function, but the diastolic function keeps being um, horrible. So these are ventricles that you cannot feel that are not gonna eject well. And then there is very marked decrease in the uh, cardiac output at the end. And they are so volume dependent because the, there is ventricular interdependence. So when there is volume overload in one of the two ventricles, the septum moves to the other side because it can't really dilate. And then it restricts the filling of the other ventricle even further. So it's really complicated. They are very sensitive to volume overload and they're also very sensitive when you take volume out. Um, there is very significant orthostatic hypotension and cardiorenal syndrome in patients with amyloid. So uh, let me just jump this. How do you manage diuretics with these patients? Uh, usually the use of furosemide is not the best because the absorption in the intestine is not as good. So I tend to go directly to torsemide or bumetanide. They have better intestinal absorption. If needed, I add metolazone when there is uh, weight gain from fluid. Uh, adding spironolactone to the loop diuretic also helps. And uh, really, you just adjust it depending on how the patient is doing. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're going to see as a cardiologist, what you're going to be managing the most with these patients is the diuretic. Um, if you're going to give these patients IV diuretics, you have to be watching them because they can get hypotensive and azotemic very quickly if you are very aggressive in how you diurese them. So you have to go slow. And this is probably the most important part of my talk and something that uh, I want people to really understand and take home. Again, this is not really like any other form of cardiomyopathy or heart failure. So people, as they should, see heart failure with systolic dysfunction or reduced ejection fraction, immediately wanna start the patient on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or an ARNI or a beta blocker. And most of these patients don't tolerate those medications well at all. And the trials have never been shown to be any type of benefit from starting patients with amyloidosis on any of these meds. So unless the patient has amyloid and at the same time has hypertension or something like that, I wouldn't recommend to start it. Um, most patients with amyloid are not going to be hypertensive, if anything, always hypotensive. Avoid the joxin because the amyloid fibrils bind and the um, interaction may increase the risk for digitalis toxicity. Also avoid castle channel blockers. These patients are very dependent on their heart rate. 
and the negative chronotropic effect can be very profound. Same thing with beta blockers, there is no proven benefit, so they feel horrible on a beta blocker. The, the patients that come to see me with cardiac amyloid, when I see them for the first time in my clinic and I'm strongly suspecting amyloid, even before I do any testing, I take them off beta blockers and I, I will know that they, 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 they have amyloid because on, during their next visit, they tell me, I mean, I feel completely different, so much better. So this is a study that was uh, released in 2016 where they compare patients uh, with amyloid uh, with and without ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. And as you can see, the survival is much better without the medications. Also, the uh, management by the electrophysiologist is extremely important. As much as you can, try to keep these patients in normal sinus rhythm uh, because they're very dependent on the atrial kick to keep their cardiac output. Um, be very cautious with anything that lowers the heart rate significantly, like I, ju was, I just said. Um, there is really not much experience with pacemakers, AV nodal ablations. Um, the role of ICDs is still a question. Uh, we still don't know it really decreases the risk of sudden cardiac death. Uh, only used by ventricular pacing in indicated patients like left bundle branch block or when patients are chronically paced by the right side. Um, a lot of patients with amyloidosis are going to need pacemakers because they end up having cardiac conduction disease. Uh, but try to keep an adequate heart rate on these patients. Don't go too low, but also don't, don't allow the patient to go too high. I'm just going to mention the one treatment that has really shown to work for this disease. The name is Tafamadis, and that uh, is an stabilizer of the tetramer, so it doesn't allow the uh, protein to deposit in the tissue. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2018, where it showed the improvement in survival and the decrease of patients going on to heart transplant for cardiac amyloid. So it also improves the quality of life. This is the difference between six minute walk test and the Kansas quality of life risk score. These patients feel better and do better after they're studying on Tafamadis. So basically this is my proposed algorithm with, uh, for how to you know, manage these patients. I took this from uh, Dr. Singh et al. I think it's the best way to approaching it. Uh, first of all, suspected do an echocardiogram. If you have access to a PYP scan, do it because most of the patients that are gonna to present to you with cardiac amyloid are gonna have transteritin. Um, if the scan is equivocal, try equivocal, just try to do other type of testing. But if you still have questions, go ahead and ask for an endomyocardial biopsy and you'll get your diagnosis. So our patient, um, Finally, got imaging and genetic testing. This is this patient's PYP scan. As you can see, a ton of uptake in the heart compared with the ribs. Uh, the patient was studied on Tafamadis with very, very significant improvement in his symptoms. So that's my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Navas. That was a great talk and great to see you again after all these years. Um, and very appropriate because obviously we're in the Caribbean, so I'm guessing we're in that high risk population group. Um, one of our audiences was asking about the incidence or how often you see pediatric presentation of cardiovascular uh, amyloid. Not very often. I mean, I don't see children, but as I mentioned, um, especially the transteritin, the wild type. That's why it was usually called senile because you um, the average age of presentation is around 70, 75 years old. And even the AL amyloid, just uh, the average age of presentation is 50. Okay, perfect. Um, I guess another question would be, do you use or how often is invasive uh, testing used to monitor volume status in these patients? Invasive, like a CardioMEMS device or a Swangans or something like that, I'm guessing? Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, like Dr. Collado was explaining, CardioMEMS is, is such a useful tool. Um, really, you get PA pressures, uh, like you were doing a right heart cath uh, from home. 
So in patients like these where the volume is so very important, you have to keep them at this very specific level where they are not volume overloaded, but they're not volume depleted either because they're so volume sensitive. Something like cardio MEMS or any of the other, you know, uh, outpatient devices that we use are extremely useful to keep the patients in that balance and avoid uh, hospitalizations. Perfect. Uh, and one last question, the speckled echo. Um, any more for, if, for some of us who have never been exposed to it, is this something that you can do with just a transthoracic echo? It doesn't require TEE? Just a transthoracic, yeah. Perfect. So um, we have another question here on the medication that you were talking about, the tafimidis, only symptomatic treatment, and is there anything to reverse cardiac amyloid? So the tafimidis, um, actually helps with symptoms and improves prognosis and survival. So you see that uh, it usually, it takes a while to take effect. So it's a little bit frustrating at the beginning because the patients don't feel better in or sometimes almost in the first six months of treatment. Some of them feel better before that. Uh, but by a year, they're starting to feel much, much better. And they, they, because it stops the deposition of the of the uh, tetramer in the tissue, um, it kind of decreases. I don't know. I see amyloid kind of as a, a inflammatory response of the myocardium, so it kind of decreases the inflammation. So you're still going to see a thick myocardium, but the the level of restriction that you see is much less. Great. Um, thank you again. It was great seeing you, and we'll chat another time. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys. All right. So now we're going to move on, on to our next speaker. Uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Emmanuel Turner. Dr. Emmanuel Turner is going to speak on anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery current therapy. Dr. Turner works at Memorial Healthcare Systems, Jody Maggio Children's Hospital as a pediatric and adult congenital cardiac surgeon. He went to medical school at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. He then went on to do internship and general surgery residency at Duke University. This was followed by cardiothoracic surgery fellowship and congenital heart surgery fellowship at the University of Michigan. Um, he is a pediatric and adult congenital cardiac surgeon, and he has board certification in congenital heart surgery, as well as the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. So, here to speak to us again from Memorial Healthcare System, Jody Major Children's, is Dr. Emmanuel Turner on anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery current therapy. Thank you. I'm in the process of trying to share my screen, I believe. There we go. So again, I'm Emmanuel Turner, one of the pediatric and adult congenital cardiac surgeons uh, over here at Jordan Maggio Children's Hospital uh, in Memorial Healthcare System. I would like to thank the uh, Cayman Heart Fund 13th Annual International Symposium Committee for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery uh, in current therapy. Um, determining optimal, man optimal management uh, of this patient population uh, poses uh, tremendous challenges to not only the cardiac surgeon, but the cardiologist as well. Um, the exact prevalence and risk of sudden cardiac death is, is still uh, virtually unknown. Um, there's been a large influx of uh, studies and literature uh, in the recent years. And my focus today is just to make it through some of that uh, literature and those studies uh, to help with uh, decision-making uh, in this patient population. I have no disclosures. So what is uh, anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery? It's a rare congenital anomaly in, in which the uh, coronary artery uh, doesn't originate in its uh, respective sinus uh, and often has an abnormal course as it leaves the, the aorta. There are two subtypes. Uh, one is the anomalous right coronary artery from the left coronary sinus and anomalous left coronary from the right coronary sinus. In addition to the subtypes, uh, there are variations uh, within the two subtypes. One is intraarterial, 
as you can see here, the vessel kind of goes between the great vessels, the coronary goes between the two great vessels, and then intramural, as you can see, this uh, course uh, for quite a long segment there uh, is intramural or within the wall of the uh, aorta. Uh, both can happen in, in both the uh, right from the left and left from the right. Uh, to the left uh, is a CT uh, image with reformatting of a patient with the anomalous uh, right coronary from their left sinus. Uh, in pain A, uh, you actually see an intramural course. You can see it's a pretty long intramural course and probably leaves the aorta somewhere uh, right where my pointer is. Uh, in pain B, you can actually see uh, the ostia there is more oval shaped, where it should be more circular shaped in, in normal uh, anatomy. In pain C, there's a, a 3D reconstruction. This is always helpful for us to see kind of what the coronary does after it leaves uh, the aorta. And in pain D is uh, some pretty cool uh, new technology where you can actually do virtual uh, angioscopy. And it gives us an idea of what the coronary looks like on the inside of the aorta. And you can kind of see that's when we uh, see the slit-like orifice that oftentimes is associated with the intramural segment. <clears throat> In addition to the uh, variations that I just mentioned, there's also the post aortic course as to where uh, the coronaries can go. Um, and this picture uh, shows the pre pulmonic, which is in blue, interarterial, which we showed previously, sub pulmonic, and then retro aortic. All of these um, additional variations add to the potential complexity of the anomalous coronary artery. And if you didn't know, I'm, I'm trying to hammer home the numerous variations uh, that can combine uh, with both of the subtypes. Uh, as you see here, there can be a separate osteum uh, or a shared osteum, uh, or you can have the branching uh, after, the, uh, oste after the coronary leaves the, the aorta. You can have intramural and non-intramural as we mentioned previously. And then you can see the different uh, types of the ostea uh, at the level of when it leaves the, the coronary, slit like here and oval there. Uh, the thing that wasn't mentioned previously was the uh, acute angle that can happen with the takeoff. So less than 45 degrees or greater than 45 degrees. And the reason to mention all of these variations uh, and the potential combinations of the uh, subtypes is to understand that all these can play a role in the pathophysiology that leads ultimately to sudden cardiac death. I apologize, you may or may not be able to see uh, all the uh, studies on this uh, forest plot. And it's kind of a busy slide. Uh, but my point was to show all the uh, attempts at trying to elucidate the prevalence of anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery uh, and, and how uh, to observe that with different cardiac imaging. Uh, first, you can see this is coronary angiography, echo, CTA, and MR. I also want to call your attention to the wide variation uh, in where the prevalence is. I think that has uh, three potential causes. Um, one is the patient population itself, uh, two is the imaging modality, and three, uh, how the coronaries were ultimately defined. Um, there was one large population-based perspective study that did ultimately give us uh, what we often uh, quote in a lot of the studies uh, as far as prevalence uh, using ECHO, uh, right around 0.17% uh, for anomalous coronaries. That was in the uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, child group uh, using transthoracic ECHO. And then the prevalence of the right is somewhere between 0.06% uh, to 0.9% and left 0.02% to 0.1%. Uh, so you think with such uh, low prevalence, why are we so concerned with an anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery? <clears throat> well, you may have seen uh, studies or, or even reports on, on TV uh, where you see a young athlete who passes out or is found down uh, at practice uh, and um, we found that uh, when we look at autopsy series, uh, the second leading cause of sudden cardiac death in US athletes uh, is anomalous coronary. Uh, there's a US national registry that was developed back in 1980 in Minneapolis uh, that looked at all of the uh, deaths reported from 1980 to 2006. Uh, there were total almost 1900 uh, deaths. Uh, and as you can see in the uh, uh, pie chart here, uh, that the number one cause was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then the second was anomalous coronaries. Uh, it's interesting to also look at the uh, progression uh, as you look at the, uh, the bar graph to the left, that coronary uh, diseases uh, start to become more and more prevalent as you uh, look at the increasing cause of uh, sudden cardiac death. <clears throat> um, the uh, autopsy series showed that the 
coronary anomalies were the second most common cause of sudden cardiac deaths uh, in athletes during or shortly after strenuous exercise. I think that's a really key piece because uh, that's going to ultimately uh, weigh in as to how we treat these patients, both operatively and non-operatively. Uh, interesting enough, uh, one third of the sudden cardiac death in, deaths in military patients were also attributed to uh, coronary anomalies. So what causes the sudden cardiac death uh, associated with anomalous coronary? There have been uh, multiple anatomic and physiologic uh, theories proposed. Uh, the exact causes to ischemia and sudden cardiac death are likely multifactorial. Um, based on the anatomic variants that we reviewed already, um, in a young uh, person, young athlete with uh, you know, a dynamic aortic uh, under strenuous exercise, here are some of the potential uh, hypotheses that have gained, gained some traction. One, a valve-like obstruction uh, of the slit-like orifice as the actual vessel expands. You can imagine this starts out as a slit and the um, aorta gets more taut. Uh, that uh, obstruction would occur at the level of the slit-like ostia. Um, impedance to coronary flow with uh, acute angulation at the takeoff. Uh, and in three, uh, in systole, uh, the aortic dilatation and torsion uh, can cause some lateral compression on that proximal intramural segment. Just wanted to call your attention to the uh, stress perfusion defect over here. So this is an actual perfusion study, stress perfusion study done in a patient with anomalous coronary. And you can see the, how that area lights up. So this is inducible ischemia. And you can imagine if you have this happen several times, you then have uh, areas of scar, and this scar ultimately can potentially give the substrate for some lethal, lethal ventricular arrhythmias. With the many combinations of the subtypes, uh, as well as the variations of the subtypes, uh, I think we can agree that not all uh, anomalous coronary artery patients are created equally, uh, and I think that uh, continues to um, be the course uh, when we think about presentation. Um, when we look at presentation, it's a pretty wide range. Uh, when we looked at this uh, most recent group, uh, the approximately half of the patients with anomalous uh, aortic origin of the coronary artery present with uh, cardiac symptoms, uh, specifically exertional syncope and chest pain. The rest of them are incidental findings following an abnormal ECG or even pre-sport screening. And then there's the one more additional group where is sudden cardiac arrest or aborted so, uh, sudden cardiac arrest. As you can see, this is a pretty broad spectrum of presentation, uh, and this is why management decisions can be difficult and why risk uh, stratification is ultimately uh, paramount. Before we can get to risk stratification, we've got to figure out how we're going to evaluate the anomalous coronary. Um, here we uh, see echo, CT, MR, uh, coronary angiography, and IVIS. Uh, as you can see, class one data for both the CT and MR uh, make those essentially the kind of first line uh, studies. Uh, with echo and, and a good uh, quality experience sonographer, you can see the proximal origin as well as the course. Um, and also uh, it's useful in uh, stress uh, echo uh, as far as looking at functional uh, assessment for the coronary, uh, anomalous coronary. Uh, CT, uh, far and away, is probably the, the best screening tool for anomalous coronary artery. Um, because of the advancements over the last decade, uh, both with spatial resolution and, and uh, limiting the amount of radiation necessary, uh, it gives a really good uh, tomographic uh, result uh, of the cardiac anatomy, and then has the ability to reformat and give you 3D virtual angioscopy and a lot of the other things uh, to help delineate both the proximal ostia all the way through uh, the distal course of the coronary artery. Um, cardiac, uh, MR is also very useful. It's got great spatial resolution as well, uh, probably not to the degree of the CT, uh, but it does offer uh, some of the things the CT can't, uh, including valvular uh, function, uh, ventricular function, uh, and the ability to uh, help with myocardial vi viability uh, under stress uh, testing. Um, as far as uh, coronary angiography goes, it's more of a uh, complementary uh, test, uh, if necessary, uh, to go along with the invasive testing. <clears throat> um, IVIS, uh, in addition to the coronary, ang coronary angiography, can really uh, delineate the interluminal uh, geometry. Um, what I don't have pictured here is actually uh, the uh, 
nuclear perfusion uh, stress test or the single photon emission CT. Uh, it's very helpful in uh, masking ischemia and otherwise uh, asymptomatic patient and should definitely be used in the uh, asymptomatic patient uh, prior to uh, moving forward with any uh, non-operative management. So when I see a patient referred for an anomaly or the origin of the coronary artery, uh, I talk to the patient as well as the family about two primary things. Uh, one, uh, what are the characteristics of their anatomy and their anomalous coronary that may make them uh, at increased risk for sudden cardiac death above the general population, as much as we know based on the data we have. Uh, the second th thing is how do we mitigate that risk? And uh, in 2009, the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society uh, set out to clarify both the natural and unnatural or surgical history uh, of the anomalous aortic coronary arteries, uh, as well as uh, it, with the hope of informing risk stratification. <clears throat> the primary goals are kind of listed here. Uh, I think the last one, uh, identification of the anatomical features associated with evidence of ischemia and sudden cardiac events uh, was the main focus of the most recent update, which was done in 2018. So just some of the details of the study, um, patients uh, were initially enrolled pro retrospectively and then they were prospectively enrolled. Uh, there's 40 uh, institutions involved in, in this uh, registry. Uh, we're actually one of them. Um, at, the at the time of this most recent update in 2018, there were 560 total patients uh, that were uh, in the registry and, and that were uh, available to be evaluated uh, and analyzed. Um, I think it's interesting that of that 560, uh, 275 were unclassified. So that's the population that, you know, as, that, as we follow over time, we really truly can get a handle on what the natural history uh, is with this uh, particular patient population. 42% uh, were without ischemia. Uh, so that also tells us that although we're finding this more in, in, uh, on imaging uh, as far as echo and CT, not all of it uh, is related uh, or associated with ischemia. And then 9% uh, had ischemia. Um, when we look at the study results, they found that uh, the anomalous right from the left is more common uh, than the left from the right. Uh, the prevalence of ischemia is significantly lower uh, in the anomalous right from the left compared to the anomalous left from the right. Um, the anomalous left uh, when we talked about best evidence uh, for ischemia presentation was mainly associated with sudden cardiac arrest. Whereas when we talked about the anomalous right from the left, the best evidence for ischemia at time of presentation was an abnormal perfusion study first, and then a sudden cardiac arrest event uh, afterwards. 89% um, of all the sudden cardiac events occur with exertion. So this is something that definitely uh, pathophysiology related to strenuous exercise and exertion. So this is a picture and, and central picture for uh, the CHSS study and kind of um, depicts the conclusions that they kind of found from the uh, risk stratification standpoint. As you look at the anomalous left from the right, the things that really were associated with ischemia were the intramural course, a high orifice and a slit-like orifice. And as opposed to the right, um, which is oftentimes thought to be benign, those that had ischemia from the right uh, had a longer intramural course uh, associated with those being and having ischemia. So the CHSS study take home points, um, age less than 30, uh, ischemia is more likely to be seen in the anomalous left from the right. The presence of an intramural course, uh, a long intramural course, and the higher slit-like orifice. Of note, no anatomic features distinguish those uh, who had sudden cardiac events. And for the anomalous aortic right from the left uh, coronary sinus may not always be benign. Uh, just under half of the patients with ischemia uh, had anomalous right, and one third of them uh, were present uh, as far as sudden cardiac events. 
So I think we can't write the anomalous right from the left off as, as benign anymore. So balancing the risk of surgery versus the risk of sudden cardiac death can be challenging. Um, to that end, the American Association of Thoracic Surgeons put together a, a group of experts uh, to come up with guidelines back in 2016, uh, consensus guidelines uh, to direct both surgical management and non-surgical management. <clears throat> These uh, guidelines were essentially based on uh, risk stratification uh, that was confirmed and verified by the CHS study. So going through the uh, recommendations here. Uh, so if you have anomalous coronary and symptoms, uh, syncope or, or aborted sudden cardiac surgery or sudden cardiac death attributable to ischemia should be offered surgery. Uh, asymptomatic patients that have the left from the right and an interarterial inter core should also be offered surgery see both of those are class one. Um, and then the asymptomatic patients with the anomalous aortic origin from the right from the left uh, should undergo in, uh, provocative testing um, uh, to see if you can induce ischemia. And if they're asymptomatic without ischemia uh, on provocative testing, then they can be allowed to resume competitive athletics. As we get to management in just a minute, um, you'll see why that's important. So management. Uh, the only known medical therapy that has been reported is beta blocker in adults. Uh, there was a series of about uh, 50 patients, adult patients, mean age around 55, uh, that were placed on beta blockers and, and followed uh, for about a five-year uh, span and had no increased incidence of sudden cardiac death, uh, which sounds good. But then when you look closer at the demographics, they didn't have any anomalous left from the right coronary arteries or any patients less than 30 uh, years of age. So those are two of the higher risk uh, categories. So I think it's hard to make any uh, true conclusions as far as uh, the beta blocker therapy in adults uh, for anonymous coronary. Uh, the other non-operative management um, is to look at uh, exercise restriction from competitive athletics. Uh, so medical school, middle school uh, level or higher uh, with running, soccer, tennis, swimming, basketball, football, baseball, um, keeping them out of those uh, competitive athletics, uh, but allowing them to uh, participate in recreational activities uh, is one of the non-operative uh, approaches uh, to anomalous coronary. I think the key piece here is the follow-up recommendations uh, where you follow up with cardiology annually, ECG annually, echo every one to two years. I think the exercise stress test is the most important. Uh, obviously, if that turns positive, then uh, a different uh, algorithm uh, needs to be followed. So the other non-operative uh, management uh, can be up observation without exercise restriction. Um, this is for asymptomatic individuals with anomalous rights and no inducible ischemia are allowed to participate in competitive athletics. Um, and this is class 2A. Um, without any additional um, evaluation. Uh, again, here's where the follow-up recommendations are important. Uh, follow-up cardiology annually, uh, with the echo electrocardiogram an annually, echo one to two years, uh, and exercise stress test uh, one to three years uh, if competitive sports, uh, depending on the activity of the, of the sport, may wanna get a, a nuclear uh, perfusion scan. I will say that this is the decision that generates the most anxiety from families, because uh, now you have this diagnosis uh, and you aren't going to do anything and you are going to continue with uh, competitive athletics. Um, this is where both the families and the patient have to understand the uh, symptoms to look for and the risk of sudden cardiac death, which isn't zero. And we don't know exactly what that number is based on our current uh, data uh, and, and really can be, uh, something that the parents worry about. I know I've had several families call several weeks later and decided they wanna meet again and talk again over everything uh, to revisit uh, the recommendations. So when we talk about uh, operative management, oper operative management uh, the ideal repair should emulate the normal anatomy uh, with the goal of addressing the potential mechanisms of ischemia, uh, specifically the slit like ostia, the abnormal shape of the ostia, and then the possible intramural course. One of the well-known surgical techniques for anomalous uh, coronary is the unroofing technique. 
This is the preferred approach for uh, any patient with a significant intramural length. And you can see in B, uh, those are micro scissors that are actually in the kind of slit-like oval orifice uh, that are in the process of making their way around to where this is more than likely where the uh, coronary leaves the aorta. And then you actually can go ahead and, and see, see where they tack back the intima of the aorta <clears throat> and coronary uh, to keep the ostea open. I think uh, two things to note here. One, this area here is usually pretty fibrous and dense. And so you actually almost get a, a spring effect when you come around that uh, intracoronary commissure. Uh, imagine uh, just anecdotally that this is probably responsible for some of the inducible uh, ischemia. Uh, the other issue here is, as you can see, it's pretty close to the intracoronary commissure. And so what you can do is resuspend this commissure because uh, as we'll see when we look at the outcomes for the surgical management, uh, there is a fair amount of uh, AI that you can see uh, late uh, after surgery. Um, some studies uh, recently have talked about, regardless if you are this close to the intracoronary commissure, even if higher, you should just resuspend this uh, commissural post. The next technique is the neo-osteo creation. As you can see in B again, you take an instrument, they have what looks like a, a angled uh, clamp there, we use a, a coronary probe uh, to go into where we see where we think the uh, coronary leaves the aorta. Um, and right there, you can open up the intramural segment and then again, tack back the intima of the coronary to the aorta uh, and essentially create a, a new ostia. The nice thing about this uh, particular technique is you can see it does not disrupt uh, the intracoronary commissure. And so uh, using that as a decision tree, if the coronary is above the level of the commissure, I think unroofing is a great uh, option. If it's at the level or below the level of the commissure, uh, I think the neo-osteo creation is, is something that can be used uh, and, and try to maintain the integrity and geometry of the aortic valve. Lastly is uh, direct implantation of the uh, anomalous coronary artery. This is mainly for short intramural courses or uh, in the event that um, the unroofing is not going to uh, give adequate normal anatomy, meaning that the uh, ostea still isn't, isn't adequate, uh, then you can just reimplant the whole coronary. Just take a button uh, of the coronary and then bring it around and put it in its proper sinus. Here, the key here is you have to make sure you mobilize enough of the coronary to get over here, uh, as well as make sure that uh, the coronary doesn't kink. Um, for those patients that have uh, atherosclerotic proximal stenosis of the anomalous coronary, or if those in those cases where reconstruction hasn't worked, uh, coronary artery bypass grafting is always a um, default uh, procedure. I think it was uh, early on used, uh, but you always worry about competitive flow. Although surgery <clears throat> uh, hopes to relieve the hypothesis, hypothesized mechanisms of ischemia leading to sudden cardiac death, um, the long-term impact on um, the coronary artery is, is still really unknown. Uh, the things we worry about is stenosis from scarring uh, from the uh, repair itself, uh, as well as uh, accelerated um, atherosclerosis. I think uh, critical assessment of the post-surgical patients um, will ultimately help us uh, determine uh, the risk for both of those uh, issues. Uh, CHSS looked at their uh, 395 patient surgical cohort uh, and looked at all of the uh, outcomes. Um, as you see here, the median age of surgery was 13. Freedom from coronary related reoperation at, at seven years is right around 95%. Um, uh, what was interesting is freedom from mild or greater AI was 88% versus 77% um, at three years. And that's uh, without manipulation of the commissure versus with manipulation of the commissure. Um, and so you can see why that neo osteo creation and then not manipulating the commissure uh, may long-term be one of the better uh, techniques for this particular patient population. Um, and long-term, 8% developed significant AR. Uh, Brothers, uh, as, as well as the rest of her team, uh, looked at the cohort a little more closely. As you can see, uh, early mortality was 1%. Um, 
There were four to 2% with new positive uh, postoperative ischemia test. Uh, we talked about the coronary related reoperations and then the 8% uh, percent of new mild or moderate uh, aortic insufficiency. Overall, uh, there was a 7 to 13 percent composite, composite risk of uh, uh, surgical adverse events in this entire cohort. I wanted to have a quick look at our own experience uh, here at Joe DiMaggio. Uh, we've been doing patients since uh, 2011 uh, to 2019, a total of 26 patients. Uh, median age was uh, 24 years. We did 14 anomalous right from the left and uh, 12 anomalous left from the right. Um, we had, sorry, no early mortality and no patients with greater than mild aortic insufficiency. Um, I think it's interesting to look at our uh, trend. And I'll, all these are pretty small numbers, uh, but you can see our neo osteo creation uh, technique has really increased uh, over the last three years. As I talked about the decision tree earlier, uh, when we have a long proximal and distal intramural segment, uh, slit like orifice away from the commissure, neo osteo creation versus unroofing is used, slit like orifice close to the commissure. We for sure use a neo osteo creation. And we have done a, a, just a couple of the uh, reimplantations when that, that uh, intramural course is just too short uh, to be able to get into the proper commissure. Here, I just wanted to call attention to the uh, increase in, in non surgical um, management of a lot of these patients coming in. Uh, I feel like every week uh, I'm getting a call, somebody seeing one on the CT scan or echo. Um, and I think the risk stratification that the CHS study, uh, as well as the consensus guidelines has really helped us to take a closer look, especially at, the, at those anomalous right off the uh, left coronary sinus patients. The last uh, point I wanted to make was uh, looking at the folks from Texas Children uh, Congenital Heart Center. Uh, they've been uh, pretty innovative and at the forefront of a lot of the uh, studies that have come out regarding anomalous coronary artery patients. Um, they looked at uh, how standardizing an algorithm as well as creating a coronary artery program, anomaly program with a multidisciplinary team and, and how that impacted their outcomes uh, moving forward from 2012 to 2017. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting that their multidisciplinary team included a radiologist, a cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, psychologist, and social work. So all those uh, were, people were present uh, when patients came into the the hospital. And the interesting thing was, yes, they developed a standardized algorithm, but they review that algorithm the, the multidisciplinary team does uh, each year uh, to make sure they incorporate a lot of the, the new data. I think moving forward, this is a way that a lot of centers are ultimately going to uh, approach these patients, um, just given the, the complexity of the diagnosis, uh, potentially not uh, doing surgery and, and allowing um, uh, strenuous ac activities and in, in com complex or competitive sports uh, and, and how the patient and, and family need the support. Uh, I reviewed a paper that actually looked specifically at the impact uh, on life for the patient as well as the family, uh, which should be coming out soon, if not already. Uh, and, and there's some pretty significant data uh, of the uh, impact uh, that this diagnosis can carry on a family. Uh, specifically to this paper, however, uh, 50.3% of the patients they, they evaluated were considered high risk. 49% uh, were found as an incidental finding. 82% uh, have been allowed to participate in unrestricted sports activities. I think that uh, in and of itself uh, speaks to the multidisciplinary team, really looking at the risk stratification um, and, and allowing patients to, to get back to sports. Um, the operative component showed no operative uh, early deaths and 91% were asymptomatic at follow-up. Here's the uh, mentioned uh, algorithm. Uh, I've highlighted the piece uh, looking at both the anomalous uh, left from the right and the right from the left um, and the high risk uh, anatomy imaging and, and kind of what to do based on that, uh, whether or not we offer surgical uh, intervention uh, versus shared decision making with the family uh, and the exercise restriction. I think uh, the key piece there is the shared decision-making with the family. And that's what, something that I, I stress as soon as uh, I start the consultation, 
uh, is that we have to get to this decision uh, together uh, and really understand the risk stratification. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the goal is to mitigate the risk as best we can. Um, a lot of the data and, and images and, and studies that I've pre uh, presented previously uh, were of patients less than 30 years of age. Uh, I thought I need to get the middle-aged uh, people uh, involved. Uh, and so I looked uh, up the algorithm for the um, symptomatic patients greater than 35 years of age. Um, I think uh, when you think about anomalous coronaries in, in patients greater than 35 years of age, uh, perfusion defects attributed to anomalous coronary vessels is, is pretty rare uh, and more commonly associated with coronary artery disease. Uh, and there's truly not been a, a higher increase uh, in this age group uh, in respect to sudden cardiac death at, at short-term follow-up. I think there's many reasons uh, that can be stated for that. Uh, one of the big ones is that as they get older, the uh, dynamic or elasticity uh, of the aorta is less as well as the coronary. And so the uh, propensity for compression and, and changes related to the pathophysiology of uh, the ischemia is, is overall less. <clears throat> and so as we look at the uh, algorithm, you can see uh, for less than 35 years, uh, individualized consideration for revascularization or recommended uh, low intensity recreational sports only after counseling. Um, again, the same uh, type of workup uh, including both uh, a CT and then some type of uh, provocative testing. Um, if they're greater than 35 years, I actually want to rule out other causes of coronary artery disease uh, and may require uh, coronary angiography um, prior to re-engagement in sports or, or following the patient's symptoms. And this is just a, a similar representation for uh, the asymptomatic patient. And greater than 35 years, no restrictions in, in, in sports activity. So in summary, uh, I think uh, the two key points are risk stratification uh, and provocative testing are the uh, key strategies in the asymptomatic patient, especially. Um, and looking at the anomalous right from the left coronary artery uh, uh, specifically, I think ultimately the CSS, CHSS registry data uh, will help with long-term follow-up questions regarding non-operative versus operative management. Uh, and, and as one of their goals, try to look at the natural and unnatural history um, to hopefully help us determine one should we be doing surgery, um, especially on the asymptomatic uh, right patients. Uh, and if so, uh, is there a subset that uh, may benefit more from non-operative versus operative management? And then lastly, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the coronary artery program allows for a multidisciplinary approach to a complex patient. Uh, and standardization to the standardization to the follow-up. I think that's the key piece. If you're going to operate on these patients, uh, you definitely have to have a standardized approach uh, to follow them up, not only uh, just for uh, the anatomy, but also uh, functionally uh, with some kind of provocative testing uh, at six months or, or a year. And with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Turner, uh, for the talk. It's great uh, to see a representative from Memorial because just like I did my training with Dr. Navas, I did work at Memorial for five years before relocating here to Cayman Islands. So always great to see people representing the hospitals where I worked at. Um, we, we do have a question uh, from the audience and the question reads, is this condition only aggravated by exercise? And part two, are there any presenting symptoms that would raise suspicion? Um, looking back through the data and, and the talk, uh, the highest uh, portion of patients that present with ischemia uh, had a component of uh, strenuous exercise, whether during or shortly thereafter. Uh, and, and so I think there is a component that is mainly related to the uh, increase uh, in the systolic uh, dimension of the aorta, especially when you have some of the variants uh, of the subtypes, specifically the slit-like orifice. Uh, can I say for sure? No, uh, we just don't have that delineated well enough with the data that we have. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of um, uh, physiologic uh, hypothesis out there. Uh, but we do feel like there is a, a component related to strenuous exercise. And then I'm sorry, the second question was, uh, is, is there specific symptoms? 
uh, as you as you saw in the data I presented from the um, studies, half of the patients are just incidental finding on the EC, uh, just an incident, uh, abnormal ECG or uh, just on a screening uh, athletic study. Um, so 50, half of the patients won't won't have any symptoms, and then the true patients that have them, it's usually pretty real. Um, the patients that I've seen that are symptomatic have uh, exertional syncope. Uh, I had a uh, football player pass out. Uh, now he was just saying he hadn't drunk enough water, but it, it, it was real and, and related to a pretty hard day, a long day uh, in the sun playing football. Um, the chest pain, uh, I think that's a little bit harder uh, in the younger population to figure out if it's truly related or is it more uh, musculoskeletal. So as a follow-up to that, a lot of uh, GPs and pediatricians and family practitioners are involved in programs to uh, screen athletes, young athletes. So what would you comment? Because the guidelines, when you look at the world guidelines are so different. Some of them are only clinical history with family history. Some of them include ECG. So I guess what would, uh, what would ideally be a way to screen athletes? Does it depend on the competitiveness of the athletes or what would you say to that? Um, as far as what's the best screening symptom or history? Well, if you were designing a screening protocol for athletes, for competitive athletes, mm -hmm. what would be a good way to screen for this? Uh, I think that's part of, you know, the CHS study to, to try to delineate that. Uh, right now, I don't know that we have one. I, I think uh, echo is, is decent. Um, and I feel like, uh, but to get to the echo piece, you have to have either symptoms. And if you have symptoms, we, you know we're going to see us. Uh, it's the patients that don't have symptoms is what we need the screening tool for. And uh, outside of the abnormal ECG, I don't know that we have anything that's better. Um, there, from a uh, family standpoint, there seems to be some clustering of anomalous coronary in, in uh, families, but the genetic piece has not, not been fully uh, delineated. All right, so um, we have another question here from the audience. Okay. Uh, they say, so are there any characteristics ECG changes to look out for? Um, so that, that's a really good question. It, it, it depends on where the uh, ischemia is located specifically to the leads. Um, I think if you have an abnormal ECG in, in a young athlete, then that, that definitely would uh, prompt to get an echo at least at minimum and a CT scan uh, just to, to be able to delineate the anatomy. Because it'd be strange to have, uh, you know, without the um, possible uh, coronary artery disease in, in such a young patient. Perfect. So before we let you go, I just want to make sure if anybody else has any final questions, they have time to send them in. We have a few more. Um, we can wait a, a minute or so. Um, maybe in the meanwhile, can you comment uh, if you get a very young child referred to you for incidental or some mild symptoms? Do you try, given that you want to avoid reoperation and other complications due to surgery, how far do you try to Wait, what is a kind of ideal age for surgery if you are going to recommend surgery? That's a great question. Um, so we think that children less than 10, uh, we should wait um, just to allow for uh, the potential risk of, of surgery, specifically the aortic valve uh, and the, the coronary um, integrity. Um, but there has been reports of patients six and eight that required surgery that were having uh, symptoms and, and on provocative testing were positive. Uh, that being said, we try to get them above 10 uh, before offering surgery. Excellent. Um, thank you, Dr. Turner. We're going to let you go. You. It was a great talk. So next up on our agenda, we have Dr. Ian Del Conde. Dr. Ian Del Conde works in the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute at Baptist Health South Florida, and he's going to be speaking on justification for advanced therapies in pulmonary embolism. Dr. Del Conde is a vascular medicine specialist and the vascular medicine program director at Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute, which is a part of Baptist Health South Florida. He's board certified in internal medicine, cardiology, vascular medicine, and vascular interpretation. His clinical expertise involves the study and treatment of diseases that affect the arterial, venous, and lymphatic systems, including peripheral artery disease, carotid and renal artery disease, resistant hypertension, venous thromboembolic disease, venous insufficiency, and less common vascular diseases such as fibromuscular dysplasia and vasculitis. 
He graduated in Lasalle University for medical school. He completed his internship and residency in internal medicine in Brigham and Women's in Harvard Medical School in Boston. He then completed fellowships in cardiology and vascular medicine at the Mount Sinai School in New York. And he was the attendant physician in Mass General. Dr. Del Conde has focused his career on the study of thrombosis and vascular diseases. He's a member of the Society for Vascular Medicine and the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. So here is Dr. Del Conde to speak about justification for advanced therapies in pulmonary embolism. Thank you sir, so much. It is a true pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, I did this once in person and it was a much better experience than doing this virtually, but this is still great. And I very much look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. I'm gonna change gears a little bit with this talk about pulmonary embolism. It's a disease that sometimes falls into no man's land because a number of different specialists could be dealing with these patients. So let's start off with a case. You have a 45 year old woman who complains of shortness of breath for three days. You see her in the emergency room. She's a little tachycardic perhaps, uh, relative, you know, considering she's, she's at rest. Blood pressure is okay. She's setting reasonably okay. You get an echo, pulmonary pressures are slightly elevated and this is her CAT scan. She has pulmonary embolism with a thrombus crossing the pulmonary artery bifurcation. So what's the best way to treat this patient? She looks good, she's young, she's got a saddle embolus technically, and that, that's a, a term that sometimes makes people nervous, but how should she be managed? Is anticoagulation alone sufficient for this patient? So the, the problem with pulmonary embolism is that it presents in a continuum of severity. It can range from small incidentally discovered pulmonary embolism that involves the segmental and subsegmental branches, all the way to large emboli that occlude flow in the main pulmonary arteries as you're seeing on the panel to your right. And this typically leads to cardiogenic shock and is associated with very high levels or risks of um, mortality in excess of 50%. And in the middle, you still see all that continuum. So how should you treat these patients? So it's clear that the patient with low risk PE can be safely managed with anticoagulation, and that's the standard of care. And this is fortunately the majority of the patients, but then you have a subset of patients with very large PE, very high risk of death, who warrant more aggressive intervention that classically has been uh, synonymous to systemic thrombolysis or surgical embolectomy, which is not commonly performed. It is performed, but not commonly. And in the middle, you have this submassive or intermediate risk category with an intermediate risk of mortality ranging between three and 15%. And this is where the dilemma exists. How do you approach these patients? Is there a specialist in your system that can accurately identify these patients and stratify them and recommend an effective treatment strategy? This is another case of a woman who became hypotensive, tachycardic, was already on neosinephrine, and this was her CAT scan. This patient was quickly taken for surgical embolectomy. This is what the surgeon retrieved from her pulmonary arteries. This is her post-operative scan, and she did extremely well. So let's think for a second, why do these patients die? Why do people die in pulmonary embolism? They don't die of hypoxia, we can deal with the hypoxia most of the time. Why do they die? Well, let's think about the pulmonary circulation for a moment. The pulmonary circulation, as you know, is very different than the systemic circulation. This is a low pressure, low resistance, low capacitance circulation. The right ventricle, as you see in this coronal view of a cardiac MRI, the right ventricle is a thin walled chamber as opposed to the left chamber, which is a much more muscular uh, chamber, you know, with a thickness of, you know, this welt about a centimeter in thickness, the RV is much thinner. Um, the right ventricle receives blood flow during both systole and diastole. And as such, this, this chamber, the right ventricle doesn't do well with sudden elevations and afterload. The, the left ventricle is very well prepared to deal with sudden elevations and afterload. 
the right ventricle is not well suited for this. It just doesn't have enough strength to do this. So if you suddenly increase the afterload of the right ventricle, the right ventricle cannot overcome that pressure and it responds by dilating and ultimately failing. So you can see this in a cross-sectional cartoon of the heart. This is the left ventricle, which is a nice football shaped and the crescent shaped uh, right ventricle. If there is sudden increase in the afterload, obviously in right ventricular hypertrophy would occur in chronic settings, but in the acute situation, the right ventricle also dilates, pushes the interventricular septum to the left, decreasing left ventricular preload and cardiac output, and also ultimately decreasing perfusion to the right ventricle. This is a very nice graph because it teaches us about physiology. And it, this is really the key as to why people don't do well with pulmonary embolism. Here you have a graph. On the y-axis, you have the stroke volume of the left ventricle. And then I'm gonna show you the stroke volume of the right ventricle here. And in the x-axis, you have the afterload expressed as the, as the uh, pulmonary artery pressure or systemic pressure in the case of the left ventricle. And when you, what you can see in the left ventricle is that you can increase the afterload of the left ventricle and only when you get to mean arterial pressures, mean arterial pressures of around 130, do you suddenly begin to see a gradual drop in stroke volume. That's the reason you can have, you know, pretty severe uncontrolled hypertension and you're not gonna develop cardiogenic shock. You might develop other issues, encephalopathy or, or perhaps a coronary syndrome, but you're not gonna develop cardiogenic shock because the stroke volume is not gonna drop. But look at what happens to the right ventricle. The right ventricle, as I mentioned, does not do well with sudden increases in afterload. And with just a few millimeters of mercury elevation in the afterload, the systolic volume drops, the stroke volume drops, and that's what leads to cardiogenic shock in these patients. So these are standard definitions that we use here in the United States, slightly different in Europe, but these are definitions that you should get used to using uh, in every single patient with pulmonary embolism that you evaluate. You have your low risk PE, which are your typical patients with PE on one spectrum. In the other end of the spectrum, it's uh, the patients with massive pulmonary embolism who by definition are hemodynamically unstable. And we typically refer to sustained hypotension with systolics less than 90 for over 15 minutes, or if there's a significant difference between their baseline blood pressures and the blood pressures that they're presenting, patients who now have a vasopressor requirement or patients who are profoundly bradycardic. Submassive PE patients are patients who are hemodynamically stable, but you can already identify that their right ventricle is suffering. And you can assess this either by echo or CT showing right ventricular dilatation and dysfunction. By CT, we like to measure the RV to LV ratio uh, and it's typically greater than 0 0.9 when the right ventricle is suffering. And you can also measure biomarkers, typically pro-BMP or troponin uh, I or T. And this identifies patients who are not massive, but they're not low risk and they are at increased risk of adverse outcomes. So this is interesting because it's a historical fact that tells you why this field of pulmonary embolism is a little bit of the wild west still in 2021. That's actually the reason it's exciting to be uh, working in this field because we don't have class 1A recommendations. I mean, we have some, but not, not many. And so still understanding physiology, pathophysiology and data pays off. So this is an example. This is from 2012, sorry, 2002, Archives of Internal Medicine, two papers uh, looking at thrombolysis in higher risk pulmonary embolism. The conclusion of the study showed, um, or the authors concluded that in pulmonary embolism, thrombolysis with heparin led to improved outcomes. And in that same issue, the editor, took exactly the opposite stance. He basically said, no, until there's more data, we should not be treating patients with thrombolytic therapy. And we're pretty much still um, in the same debate. Uh, we're a little bit more advanced, but the, the essence is still the same. But let's take a step back. Who 
with pulmonary embolism would benefit from more aggressive therapy? Well, there's just two, two subsets of, uh, of patients. If you can identify the patient with acute PE who is at high risk of dying if you anticoagulate alone, then that is a patient who would benefit from more advanced therapies. And the other one is trying to identify the patient likely to develop CTEP or chronic thrombolic pulmonary hypertension. And if you intervene in these patients early enough, you might prevent that CTEP. No great data, but at least it, it, it's sound thinking. Look at this CAT scan. The reason I'm showing you is not because of the large clots that you can see in the main pulmonary artery. It's not because of these clots that I'm showing this CAT scan. It's because of this. It's because the, um, the right ventricle is very dilated. And those are the, the, the findings that we're looking for, the right ventricle in comparison to the left ventricle. So this is another, uh, this is actually the same patient. You can see the large uh, occlusive thrombi in the main bilateral PAs in two different views. And this is the dilated right ventricle. So the way to measure the RV 12V ratio, number one, most institutions, most radiologists and most institutions don't routinely report RV 12V ratio, but they should. And if they don't, you should also get into the habit of personally reviewing these images and measure that RV LV ratio yourself. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna scroll up and down the CAT scan and you're gonna find the free wall of the right ventricle and trace a perpendicular line to the septum and take the maximal diameter of the right ventricle. And then in a different plane of needed, it doesn't matter, you're gonna scroll up and down and find the maximal diameter of the left ventricle and do the same. And then you're gonna get the ratio. And if it's more than 0 0.9, that's abnormal. The right ventricle should always be smaller than the left ventricle. And you can also do this by echo. So this is the echo of that same patient. And even though the quality of the echo is not great, you can clearly see that the right ventricle is markedly dilated and hypokinetic. So let's go back to the earlier data. So what we know from the ICAPR trial is that patients with acute pulmonary embolism with evidence of right ventricular dysfunction have a markedly increased mortality up to 20% in those series compared to similar patients, but who did not have right ventricular dilatation or dysfunction. So it's a doubling in the risk of in-hospital mortality just by virtue of identifying right ventricular dilatation. Obviously, if you go to hemodynamically unstable patients, so these are the massive PE, the mortality is very high, 58% by three months. The data behind RV12V ratio comes from um, Swiss investigators. And what they sh have shown many times is that you can accurately stratify these patients. So patients with an increased RV12V ratio have less survival, and they generally do worse. They have more complications. So that's the reason. This is a very useful marker. And again, this can be a, a parameter that you measure in a non-gated study. Uh, it can be an echo, or, which is harder to do, or it can be a CAT scan, which is relatively easy to do. Uh, but this is a, a measure that should always be obtained. And you should always, in patients with QP, check a proBNP level and a troponin level because again, if these, if these levels are elevated, they also predict risk of death or escalation of therapy. You can get the same graph and simply substitute ProBMP for troponin. It's exactly the same. So what do the guidelines say? Um, the guidelines basically are timid. They give a class 2C, not strong on revascularizing, uh, through intervention or uh, pharmacological thrombolysis, patients with submassive PE, but even on massive PE, uh, you know, there's a class 2A. These are very data-oriented guidelines, and this is just a field where data is generally lacking. Um, if you think about uh, what, what do we know about thrombolysis in pulmonary hypertension, well, there are a few studies, but not that many. So this is a an important historical study that showed that if you took patients who were hemodynamically stable, but with evidence of right-sided dysfunction, and you treated them with systemic thrombolysis, 
you have to, you cut by 50% the risk of death or uh, any major complications from pulmonary embolism, but the cost was a substantial increase in the risk of major bleeding from 8% to 22% if you gave them front thrombolysis, and also a threefold increase in intracranial bleed um, quoted in that study at 1.2%. So what do we know about systemic thrombolysis in massive pulmonary embolism? Because it would appear that most people say, okay, that's that's generally justified, but there's actually not great data. So the only study that looked at systemic thrombolysis in massive pulmonary embolism was this study back in the 1990s from Spain. Uh, and they randomized patients and they stopped the trial after the first eight patients were enrolled because all four patients in the anticoagulation arm died and all four patients in the thrombolysis group survived. And that's the only data that we have for systemic thrombolysis in massive PE. And that's the reason that guidelines, which are very pragmatic, still give it a two-way, two-B um, indication. So similar data, I already discussed this, but I'm going to basically forward to, to this because this is a more contemporary trial. This is the, the PATHO trial, uh, looking at a newer thrombolytic tenecteplase in patients with submassive pulmonary embolism. In, in Europe, this is termed intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. They have low intermediate and high risk intermediate, uh, depending on whether they only have RV12E ratio increase or they have the RV2, RV12E ratio increase plus positive biomarkers. So these patients, over a thousand patients, a pretty sizable trial, randomized to anticoagulation alone or anticoagulation plus systemic thrombolysis with tenecteplase. And what the study showed is that the risk of all-cause mortality or hemodynamic collapse within seven days of randomization was significantly decreased in patients who received tenecteplase. Um, the cost, once again, was an increase in bleeding. So you can see the numbers here for yourselves. So the absolute numbers went from six to 32 for major bleeding. And age was a very important discriminant factor. Patients less than 75 years of age tended to do well with systemic thrombolysis. There was net benefit, but patients who were more elderly, greater than 75 years of age, had such significant increase in major bleeding complications that it tended to cancel out uh, benefits in terms of reduction in mortality related to the PE itself. But the conclusions of PATHO were that thrombolysis in these patients basically confirmed the concept that patients with right ventricular dilatation or dysfunction and pulmonary embolism, even if they're hemodynamically stable, they are at increased risk of poor outcomes, and they do benefit from aggressive management with revascularization, in this case, pharmacological thrombolysis. Of course, the limitation was bleeding, but the premise was still the same. These patients do better if you revascularize them, if you revascularize the pulmonary arteries with some intervention. Um, so that has really set up the stage for catheter-directed interventions. And one of the, um, the first approved devices for this is the ECOS catheter. It's a catheter that's advanced typically through the femoral vein or the internal jugular into the pulmonary artery where the thrombus is. And it has some sonic elements that emit ultrasound. And the idea behind this is that you can infuse thrombolysis at a fraction of the dose of systemic thrombolysis. So to put things into context, the dose for systemic TPA for PE is 100 milligrams of TPA over two hours. So when you use catheter-directed thrombolysis using the ECOS catheter, it's usually about 0 0.5 milligrams an hour to one milligram an hour for a total dose of about 20 to 24 milligrams. So it's a fraction, it's about a fourth of the total dose. And you instill it directly into the thrombus, so the local concentrations 
are still significant, but the systemic uh, dose is much lower. And these sonic beams, apparently, well, the, the idea is that they loosen the fibrin strands and then allow the, the, the TPA to penetrate into the fibrin and do its trick. So there aren't too many randomized blinded controlled studies on this, but there is an interesting study that, that looked at this, uh, which is the Seattle 2 study. And it simply looked at RV12V -E ratio. And pre-procedure, the RV12V -E ratio of these patients was 1.5. Immediately, or 48 hours post-procedure, it had dropped to 1.1. So if I, if you remember that I said that these patients die of right ventricular failure, a decrease in RV12V -E ratio from 1.5 to 1.1 is very interesting. And the PA pressures also drop pre-procedure from 51 to immediately post-procedure 37, uh, which stays sort of uh, stable over 48 hours. The FDA has approved the ECOS catheter specifically for the treatment of PE. This is a real patient that we saw, uh, pulmonary embolism, and again, I'm gonna encourage you to forget this, the importance of the saddle embolus. The saddle embolus is irrelevant. What matters is the size of the right ventricle. The anatomy of the thrombus might be important when you're planning the procedure, but not for risk stratification. Um, so resist uh, making a big deal just because it's saddle. And you look at the right ventricle, it's very dilated. This patient proceeded to uh, a catheter-based procedure. The ECOS catheter is advanced and you can see the sonic elements here. And I do not have the post-procedure uh, image to show you, but there was significant revascularization of the, the entire upper lobes of the, of the right lung. Um, there are some patients who will not be able to tolerate catheter-directed thrombolysis. Even if it's a fraction of the systemic dose, they simply have an absolute contraindication, such as recent surgery, intracranial lesions that can bleed, recent stroke, et cetera. So uh, there's a new option, uh, and this is now FDA approved. This is an aspiration catheter that was initially developed for uh, the intracranial vasculature and stroke, and also for peripheral vessels, such as the clotting AV fistulas and dialysis patients. So this is a penumbra catheter that can aspirate uh, with high degrees of suction, high negative pressures. So we advance the, uh, the catheter directly to where the thrombus is. And you can see a fairly occlusive thrombus here accompanied by a significant right ventricular dilatation. And within two days of this procedure, no thrombolysis. There is a marked reduction in the thrombus burden. Angiovac is a, is a extracorporeal bypass circuit. It's a venous venous bypass system that allows a very large 26 French suction cup to be advanced into the pulmonary vasculature. And it allows a very significant aspiration of material. Um, it is a very difficult device to maneuver and to navigate in the pulmonary vessels. Uh, there have been many complications that have been reported from this, but in experienced hands, it can be done and very, very large amounts of thrombus can be quickly extracted through, through this uh, vacuum system in, in, in patients. So it's something that, that advanced centers tend to use. This is one of the, the newer devices we're currently investigating in a, in a open label uh, trial. It's the Bashir catheter, um, which basically advances a net-like structure that can be deployed within the thrombus. Um, TPA can be instilled and then aspirated and, um, and mechanically fragmented. So this is an image of the catheters being advanced bilaterally. Um, and you can see that, um, that in, in this case, there is significant perfusion defect in the upper lobes. And after immediately after the, um, the procedure, there is marked revascularization. So in summary, 
every single patient with acute pulmonary embolism should be risk stratified, even if they look fine and even if their blood pressure is normal, always measure the RV 12 u ratio, encourage your radiologist to report routinely. Always check a ProBNP and a troponin, uh, get an echo and look at RV function and obviously clinically assess the patient. When I see someone who has elevated heart rates at rest, I get concerned because that basically tells you that their cardiovascular or cardiopulmonary reserve is at the, um, at the max. Massive PE patients are a true emergency. Uh, we treat these patients with either systemic thrombolysis or surgical embolectomy if it can be, be performed quickly. And if you have a interventional team that is ready to go 24 seven, that is also uh, an option. Um, and for patients with submassive PE, this is where the, the real dilemma, um, uh, this is where you have the real dilemma. Um, you can consider thrombolysis in some of these patients, especially if they're younger than 75 years of age. Uh, and definitely catheter-directed lysis. Now, I hope that you have realized that there's no way that all of this could be done by a single person. So the way that we address pulmonary embolism in our institution, um, as well as many of the, the major institutions across the, the United States is through a PERT, a pulmonary embolism response team. So we've developed algorithms and there's a, a call schedule. And when you see a patient in the emergency room or in the wards with acute PE, you risk stratify them. Uh, their RV 12 u ratio is increased. They have elevated markers or you're just concerned. Um, you activate the PERT team and the PERT team involves always a clinical specialist, an interventional specialist. I've been very lucky to, to work with Jim Beninati, who is uh, one of the pioneers in, in catheter intervention for, for PE. We work closely with the cardiothoracic surgical team. Lissardo Garcia has been very good. And with the critical uh, care team also. Um, and this is how we manage PE at our institution. And I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Del Conde. That was great. Um, it's hard to imagine there's such a common problem that most of us face uh, so frequently, it's still so daunting in the management. Um, we have a question. The use of the RV to LV ratio, do you use it, for instance, to monitor patients more than just on admission for PE? Because I assume some patients originally come in with a normal RV to LV ratio and may progress to uh, an abnormal one. Yeah, so, you know, it's a, it's a good question. The, the problem with getting RV to LV ratios is that the best way to do it with the least amount of variability is with CAT scans. Um, this has been shown and we actually have um, a paper out on this. It's, it's hard to do by echo. It can be done, but it's hard. It's technically hard to, to do. Um, and the problem obviously with CAT scan is you have the radiation and the use of contrast. So we assess the patient. And even if we, don't, even if we decide to not aggressively treat at the get-go, we monitor the patient very carefully, clinically, looking at resting vital signs. When the vital signs seem okay at rest, we walk the patient. And if we see a disproportionate uh, tachycardic response or they, they just feel extremely short of breath after two days of uh, good therapeutic anticoagulation, then that's when we start uh, thinking, you know, we better go in and, uh, and, and do something more advanced. This is obviously for those patients who are in the, in the middle submassive category. Occasionally we do repeat the CAT scan two or three days later, uh, but, but it's not routinely done. We wanna avoid obviously contrast and radiation. And as a follow-up to that, if you were a patient that did receive whatever therapy to revascularize, be, if it was successful, how quickly would you see a reversal in the RV-LV ratio? And is any of that a predictor of those who are going to have pulmonary hypertension later on if you don't see a reversal? So you, you see the reversal very quickly, very quickly. Within 48 hours, you see that the right ventricle has decompressed. You see it by echo. If you repeat the CAT scan, you see it there as well. You can see it in those trials that I mentioned, such as the, the Seattle 2. Um, you would think that this 
signifies that the patient is at decreased risk of not only worse outcomes, but also less risk of developing chronic thrombolic pulmonary hypertension. But that is data that we still don't have. We're looking for it. And I ultimately feel that we will be able to demonstrate that, that these patients do better, not only in the short term, but also in the long run, especially if they're younger. So if we see a young person who's very functional, um, who comes in with large PE, we want to make sure that this person's ability to exercise throughout life is not going to be permanently impaired by leaving a large burden uh, of pulmonary embolism behind um, just by treating with anticoagulation alone. So age matters a great deal. Okay, um, now I'm specifically talking about the echosonic catheter. Um, maybe I missed that part, but how do you prevent a downstream shower of small clots? I didn't catch that it had an aspiration or protective device, so. Yeah, it doesn't. Um, so basically, you um you instill TPA and the TPA basically activates your own plasminogen in your own blood. Uh, your body's perfectly capable of fibrinolysis. I mean, that's part of our, our hemostatic system. Um, our bodies are very good in building clots and then slowly degrading them. So TPA works by activating that plasminogen into plasmin. So you basically activate the plasmin just where the clot is and it starts degrading it. Um, and you normally don't see a big problem with downstream uh, shower embolization. Sometimes you can see that if you have very large thrombi in the central pulmonary artery and you just try to mechanically fragment it, then you can see that it breaks off. And then now instead of having one big clot in the main pulmonary artery, now you have a bunch of clots blocking or obstructing the, the segmental branches or subsegmental branches. But nowadays we really do a purely mechanical fragmentation. It's almost always aspiration or, or catheter directed thrombolysis. Perfect, we have two more questions. The first one, is there a defined period of time that ECOS or thrombolysis can be offered to an otherwise appropriately selected patient? Great question. Um, so we extrapolate a lot of, uh, of this data from DVT. Um, we feel that we can still have a positive outcome on these patients, a positive impact on the outcome of these patients uh, up to a week after they present. Um, so sometimes we'll, we'll watch these patients. Sometimes they'll be sort of intermediate and we'll just keep an eye on them for two, three days uh, and depending on how they respond to full dose anticoagulation, if by the end of four days or so, they're still functionally impaired, we still thrombolyze. It's still very amenable to thrombolysis. It's not as if the clot has organized and is now resistant to it. All right. I think that answered pretty much the next question, which was, is there a time frame after which systemic thrombolysis and bolectomy is not effective? It would be so far out, uh, weeks, weeks out. So, so sometimes when we see someone that, you know, has been having the classical story is someone who became short of breath four weeks ago. And ever since then, they've just been profoundly short of breath, severe dyspnea on exertion. You bring them in and you realize that they have thrombi. You can try it, but it's not gonna work. So sometimes we end up referring these patients for pulmonary endarterectomy in specialized centers. Perfect. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Del Conde. With that, we'll say goodbye. We'll go uh, to our next talk. So next to join us is Dr. Satinder Sandhu from Jackson Memorial Jackson Health System, speaking to us about transcatheter treatment of congenital heart disease. Dr. Sandhu is a professor of pediatric at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, the director of the Pediatric Cardiac Catheterization Lab at Jackson Memorial Hospital and the director of adult congenital heart disease. She completed her residency in pediatrics at Penn State, followed by a fellowship in pediatric cardiology at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia. 
She's board certified in pediatric cardiology by the American Board of Pediatrics and in adult congenital heart disease by the American Board of Internal Medicine. She has published numerous articles and was awarded the United Nations Broward County Chapter Award for her humanitarian work in 2019. So here's Dr. Sandu from Jackson Memorial speaking about transcatheter treatment of congenital heart disease. Good evening. Uh, let me just share my screen here. I'd like to thank the organizing committee at the Cayman Heart Fund for the opportunity to present today. All of the talks so far have been so incredible and I have learned so much. Today, what I'm gonna do is provide an overview of transcatheter treatment and congenital heart disease. And this can be a wide range, starting from atrial septostomy down to valvuloplasty in any of the valves, angioplasty or any of the arteries, veins, device closure, if you can find a hole in the heart, percutaneous valve placements, fetal intervention, and then device retrieval. Just remember that the heart in a child ha can have so many variables that it's a very wide range. This actually all started with a paper that was written by Dr. Miller and Dr. Rashkind in 1966, creation of an atrial septal defect without thoracotomy for a child with transposition of the great arteries. This allowed for better mixing. And then from there on revol revolutionized the field of congenital heart disease for its non-surgical treatment. If you take a look at it, basically, a patient shows up who has transposition of the great arteries is very blue. And you look at the interatrial septum, and what you'll see is that there is really a very small hole there. So mixing is a big problem. You take a catheter wire, put it into the left atrium, and track a cath balloon catheter, balloon septostomy catheter over it. You then go ahead and pull it back, and you create a hole. It's traditionally known that the hole is about as big as the jerk at the end of the catheter. Now you go ahead and take a look and see how nice and wide it is. This will allow for better mixing. This will allow for, um, you know, for us to wait until the ch child can go to surgery. So balloon atrial septostomy in a neonate provides improved mixing, but it also creates a pop-off for pulmonary artery hypertension, significant mitral valve stenosis, where you just need to relieve that LA pressure for a period of time before something can be done. Complications are extremely rare, and you can see perforation, IBC avulsion, if you've been very aggressive, very rare, I haven't seen it, injury to mitral valve or injury to pulmonary band. Now, once again, using ECHO to do this procedure um, really helps with it, which is where Dr. Hunter and Dr. Swaminathan from my program come in, into play. It's not just limited to a child. In adults or young adults where you have um, pulmonary artery hypertension with RV pressures that are systemic. Uh, so here you take a look. This is a 16-year-old child who had the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and a PDA. Um, she was seen in 2013 in Texas and she, she had closure of the PDA with an amplatzer muscular VSD device hoping that the pulmonary artery pressures would come down. She then started presenting with episodes of syncope and in 2018 underwent cutting balloon and balloon dilation of the atrial septum after a transseptal balloon dilate, uh, transseptal had been done. She continued to have these episodes of syncope and had um, and bradycardia and uh, requiring resuscitation. So she underwent a cardiac cath a few years ago, um, in 2019. We found that her RV pressures were about 135% of systemic. Her pulmonary vascular resistance was about 21.8 wood units. And so, what we did was we went ahead and put a stent across her atrial septum, allowing for right to left shunting. And these episodes of, um, of bradycardia and syncope went away. Now, once again, she probably will need something else. A reverse spots can also be done, but this can also help with, with, the, with, with her symptoms. Valvuloplasty, pulmonary valvuloplasty was one of the first few valvuloplasties done in pediatrics. We also do them in the aortic mitral valves. And when you look at it, a, a, this is uh, what a pulmonary valve that is stenotic looks like. It's normally thickened, stenosed, and domed. You see the right ventricle is hypertrophied and the main pulmonary artery is often dilated. It can appear at any age. You take a catheter, you put it across the valve in a patient who may have a gradient of at least 40 or RV pressures that are at least 75% of systemic. And then you inflate your balloon 
And with that, you can get very good results for balloon valvuloplasty. Here's a lateral of the same. So that's when you have a hole. Here you have a right ventricle where you actually have no forward flow and you can see the strike uh, the right atrium looking very big. Here is that on lateral and you, all you see is a tiny nub over here. So you can take a radio frequency ablation wire, perforate it and then put a balloon across it and then open this pulmonary valve up. All of this leads to pulmonary regurgitation, which would, when you looked in, we looked in 1990, uh, what we found was that in sub 784 pulmonary valvuloplasties, the gradient decreased substantially. Um, it was less effective in reducing gradients in patients with dysplastic valves. Uh, major complications were rare. It was only about 0.6%, and it was inversely related to age. So younger the child, the more the likelihood of getting a complication. Iliofemoral vein occlusion, right bundle branch block were most common, and then the rest followed. Some inpatients who have pulmonary valve stenosis, who have pulmonary valvotomies that have done, been done, they have a significant amount of regurgitation, as do a lot of RV to PA conduits that have been placed, become stenotic, or they can become regurgitant. So what we know is that once a conduit is placed, the RVOT conduit eventually at some time will fail. Some patients can have multiple open heart surgeries. Some patients are beyond their fourth and fifth median stenotomies, which you know by itself increases the risk of something happening to them. And this extended functional life of the RBOT conduit without the need uh, for repeat sternotomy can be done by putting a transcatheter valve in. If you look at it, the, about 1.6 million children are born worldwide with congenital heart disease. These are the diagnosis, pulmonary stenosis, tetralogy of fellow, truncus transposition. About 22% of them will have some form of right ventricular alpha tract uh, obstruction. Non-conduit patients are about 70% and conduit patients are 30%. A lot of what we are doing right now is actually uh, working on this subgroup of patients. If you look at a patient with tetralogy of fellow, who's the most common, who's the most common diagnosis for this, you'll see that the RVOT really varies. And so there is no one um, valve that can actually fit in there. And so there's now a plethora of valves that are available, whether it's native or it's a conduit, uh, conduit uh, that needs to have a valve put in. Some of the ones that are available in the U US currently are the Melody valve, the Cribier. Valves of the native outflow are now out in trials, and then you have the venous valve. The Cribier valve, uh, you can see over here, it's, placed, it's got three quine lift, uh, leaflets, and it can go up to about 26 millimeters. Um, the bovine, the melody valve is made of bovine contegra, again with three uh, uh, leaflets, and it goes up to about 22 millimeters. If you take a look at this patient, it's an 18-year-old, giving an example, with tetralogy fellow and pulmonary atresia, had a BT shunt placed at one week of age, subsequently underwent RV2PA homograph placement at eight months of age, homograph revision at about four years of age, 12, and then again at 17. And the last homograph placement, the patient had mediastinitis, which is what you're seeing all these four to stabilize the sternum. And the patient then once again presented with homograph stenosis and regurgitation. When we looked at it initially, when the angiogram, you'll see the homograph is quite stenotic. Some of this may be catheter-related regurgitation, but a lot of it is real regurgitation right there. And what we did was we initially put a stent just to open up this valve. We then went ahead and put, um, this was a valve that has been uh, advanced ahead. And here is after the valve has been placed, you can see um, there is no regurgitation and the conduit is now wide open. You can also do this in bioprosthetic valves. If you take a look at this patient who has a bio, uh, bioprosthetic valve in the pulmonary valve position, this va valve is stenotic and regurgitant. And so here you can see this limited flow there. Um, there's a balloon that is put across it to try and see what, whether we can open it up, how far, what the diameter is going to be. And also always checking to look at the coronary arteries because coronary arteries can get compromised here. Um, and then here you can see there is a valve being placed. And then when you finish doing that, another angiogram in the pulmonary artery sh shows little to no regurgitation and this uh, and there's minimal gradient across this valve. There are procedural risks that go along with this. 
One of them is coronary artery compromise. So it's very important with your balloon inflated that you evaluate for the coronary artery. Conduit rupture and covered stents can often be used for that. Device embolization is rare. Um, first, because stents may fracture, you may need to put multiple stents in the conduit. Um, pulmonary embolic events have not been reported. Endocarditis at about 2.5% has been reported. So the patients will need endocarditis prophylaxis lifelong. If you look at it, this was an article by Dr. McElhenney in 2010. What they showed was the resolution of pulmonary regurgitation. And at two years, this was still very good. Here, I think that when you want to do this, what you want to do is really take multiple advanced imaging modules to take a look and see what your RV looks like, what this area of narrowing looks at. And color-coded segmentation sometimes actually helps our ability to visualize the dynamic nature of the right ventricular outflow tract. There are multiple companies that are coming out with native outflow tracts, and you can take a look. This is Medtronic's uh, that they have, um, which will have wide open edges on the end. And so it's a porcine pericardial valve, which is AOA treated. It's a tissue valve mounted on a self-expandable frame, uh, goes in through a rather large sheet, 25 French, um, and a loading funnel collapses on the valve prior to sheathing it. I think one of the things to do, what I like is 3D printing. And when you 3D print, you can actually see what the right ventricular alpha tract morphology is going to look like. And then you can also, you can choose the valve uh, that is going to be best suited for the outflow tract. Again, you know, when we look at the outflow tract, uh, native outflow tract, what we've learned is that the 25 French uh, delivery system is not too difficult to place because remember, these are not conduits, these are native outflow tracts. So they have, the bend is easy. Um, and, um, you know, the frame um, pulling back the carrot sometimes is a little problematic because the transcatheter pulmonary valve frame is pretty long. This can also be used for valve and valve therapy that we have. Here is a patient who had a bioprosthetic valve, as you can see, put in and um, developed significant regurgitation. Here is a right ventricular angiogram. And what you see is the RA filling with it. Um, you can see the right atrium filling. Um, and again, once again, what you do is you put your balloon across it and you try to see what the, um, what the maximum diameter for this is going to be. And then you can put your device, your transcatheter valve in the tricuspid valve position. This is really only for bioprosthetic valves right now. And um, following that, we did an RV angiogram and what we saw was minimal to no uh, tricuspid valve regurgitation. So when you look at these transcatheter valves, one of the most important thing is that um, these patients have to be carefully screened and really evaluation of the anatomic right ventricular outflow tract by multiple modalities is extremely important. I actually um, really count on uh, Dr. Christianito, who's our MRI person who really does wonderful job giving me this piece of information. And I think the dynamic nature of the anatomy uh, makes device design very challenging. And there's not a single device that will accommodate all the anatomies. And so far, um, no implanted patient has met all the engineering criteria set forth. So we're still learning. Um, uh, and, but what we do know is that transcatheter pulmonary valve therapy is safe. I think it's an adjunct to surgical therapy to avoid multiple repeat median sternotomies. Patient selection and device selection is extremely important. In mitral and tri in select patients with mitral and tricuspid valve and valve therapy, it can prolong the life of their bioprosthetic valves also. Um, many of these patients can also have pulmonary artery stenosis, so requiring pulmonary artery rehabilitation by stents. Conduit stenosis can need stents, coarctation of aorta, and venous pathways. All of these are where we use stents. Uh, when you look at uh, pulmonary artery angioplasty, we, uh, pulmonary artery stenosis to rehabilitate, we actually can try balloon angioplasties, low high pressure cutting balloons, and then we can also try stent placement in these patients. Here's a patient with a fontan, you can see the SVC and the IVC coming into the branch pulmonary arteries. Here you can see the LPA with a stent in the LPA, and this will hopefully have the patient do well. This is a paper uh, presented in 2011, which was by Holzer et al., which talked about uh, balloon angioplasty and stenting of the pulmonary arteries and adverse events. 
eight institutions, 13, 15 procedures. You can see adverse events were in 22%. I think what was most important was that non-preventable ones were 50%. Uh, most of them were very, very, um, you know, vascular cardiac trauma in 19%, but the rest of them were really um, quite um, um, mild and mostly resolved. Stenting of the coarctation of the aorta and balloon angioplasty has also been done. This could be for recurrent or native coarctation, especially with the covered stents coming in. Native coarctation treatment has, by transcatheter means, has really taken off. It's a gradient greater than 20 millimeters or systemic hypertension. Here's a patient who's had surgery, and you can see there's discrete coarctation and there's balloon angioplasty. You can see some subclavian artery stenosis over there. Intravascular ultrasound done in some of these patients who have balloon angioplasty shows actually intimal tearing, which is why I think that stenting coming along, especially in patients, um, older patients is really beneficial. You can see here, very, very narrow arch. This is a covered stent that has been put in. And um, you can see the stent advancing. And here you are with the stent in place and wide open. There's a little bit of waste, but there was no gradient in this patient. So in the last three years, we've done about 58 court patients with balloon angioplasty in about 62%. Surgery was only in five. And we put stents in about 17 of them. So really, if you take a look at it, only 9% of the patients required, needed to go to surgery. And these, are, these results are very much like the rest of the, uh, rest of the country. I think one of the things that I really enjoy doing is doing hybrid procedures with our surgeons, so our pediatric surgeons. And I, we have patients with, dia with dialysis who are young children who actually start having an SVC that looks like this once the dialysis catheter has been placed. You can see this is the catheter is out. This is all you have over here is just the track. So what we do is we go from the IBC and the surgeons will ex uh, externalize the wire on the other end. Uh, we'll create a railroad and then we will go ahead and um, stent the site of stenosis. And now you can see this is wide open and then the surgeon over the wire will just put the dialysis catheter back in. Here's a patient, let me just stop because um, th this is a patient who had a partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. In select patients with partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, you can actually find um, a channel which goes into the left atrium. And this patient was just oh, one of them. And here you can take a look, this is the SVC. Here is the anomalous vein coming in. And then there is a channel that's going into the left atrium as this turns, you will take a look at that and you'll see it actually connects with the left atrium there, SVC here, and then connecting from here is, um, so this patient underwent a covered stent placement in the SVC. And after the covered stent had been placed, what you will see is that the channel now, the anomalous pulmonary vein is now draining through that segment channel into the uh, left atrium. So this is in select patients, but definitely a possibility of doing it. Also embolization therapy for PDAs, aortopulmonary collateral, surgical shunts, uh, anomalous coronary arteries has been talked about. PDAs for the most part, um, you know, how you treat a small, large, or a hypertensive PDA varies. And now, most recently, is the neonatal PDAs that have taken over. PDAs come again in all shapes and sizes. And so, no one device fits all. Here is a coil going in, oftentimes, develop, goes to a four French catheter retrograde. You can see a loop being placed in the pulmonary artery. And then on pullback, another one being placed in the um, on the aortic, in the aortic ampulla, and then taking a look at this patient. Here is a patient with a larger PDA. So what you'll see is, here is the PDA, pulmonary artery is lighting up. And then what we did was we put an ADO device here, and you can see the ADO device is going in antegrade. Here is the retention disc being put. And now the, we look to make sure we're in good position, not causing coarctation and then the device is unsheathed. We do another angiogram, uh, looking at the pulmonary arteries to make sure that we are not obstructing the pulmonary arteries in any way. And then once we are sure that our position is good, we release it from the delivery cable. And recently, um, in, on 16th of January, 2019, the neonatal Piccolo device got uh, approved 
And this has uh, led to a completely different group of patients who are, you know, uh, above, above 700 grams uh, being treated with uh, the Piccolo device in the cath lab. Um, about, um, you can see the implant success rate was about 191 of 200. And the conclusion of, of the authors was that the study supports the safety and effectiveness of the Amplatzer Piccolo occluder, particularly in patients between 700 and 2 kilograms, where there is currently a significant unmet need in the United States. This device is uh, done with, um, through the venous route with echo support, um, and um, which is where Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Hunter we work very closely with them and they do a great job helping us with it. So if you can take it, a small PDA is coil occlusion, large diameter PDA, ADO device, neonatal is now a piccolo device and for a hypertensive reactive pulmonary artery bed, again, reactive is um, a muscular VSD device can be placed. This is what a coronary fistula looks like coming from the LV, from the left coronary artery going into the right ventricle. If you take a look at this um, again, you know, here we are with the angio in the same patient. You can take a look and see how it's emptying into the right ventricle. This is closed with a coil and the patient does well. Uh, Non-surgical treatment of secundum ASDs now has been going on for, for a very long time with the first one being described by Dr. Terry King many, many years ago. Uh, the more popular de devices now are the Gore Helix device and then the Amplatz Acceptal Occluder. You, oh, you can close in a wide variety of reasons, secundum ASD, postoperative defects, fenestrate fontans, and PFO with paradoxical embolus, and this is the Amplatz of PFO device. Uh, I closed mine using the intracardiac echo, and you can see here is the patient. This is the home view, and in a minute you'll see the um, catheter being placed across. There's a hole there, and This is the ASD right there being measured. Once we've measured it, look, and then we go ahead and we sorry. There you go, see the device going in. You want to make sure your rims are in good position. You want to check the position. You want to make sure that it's not going to move as soon as you release it. And once you're happy with it, you can release it from the delivery cable. The Amplatz Acceptal Occluder actually has a very good profile. And here it is released from the delivery cable. You can also close multiple ASDs in the same manner, in the same sitting. And, but you want to always make sure that you have enough rim because what you don't want to do ha is have um, pericardial effusions later on. And again, closure of NASD with a small rim, less than five millimeters needs to be really done very, very thoughtfully. Occasionally, these may actually embolize. And here is a device that is being snared. Once you snare it, you then want to always make sure that it lines very well with your sheath so that you can pull it inside that and bring it out of the patient. I think uh, closing a defect is not the most challenging thing. It is knowing how to take it out and being able to deal with the complication that is very, very important. Um, complications have been reported. Between 2002 and 2014, there were 125 erosions. It was noted that most of them had um, deficient rims and therefore that is now um, a contraindication to um, closing these um, ASDs with deficient rims. Muscular VSDs occur in about 10%. Where there is a large volume overload, those patients can also undergo closure um, using uh, the transcatheter technique. The, it's an Amplatz of VSD device. It's a double disc device with a waist. And essentially what you do is you create a railroad, you go from the aorta, go into the pulmonary artery, snare it, bring it out, and then take your catheter and put it across. That's what you do for patients who are older. Um, and here you can see here is a VSD. Here is the snare being put in, snare outline. And now the catheter is going across that. You can see the VSD device, VSD being delivered, and then no residual shunt there. I think in small children, uh, it behooves us to actually work very well with our surgeons to do a hybrid approach to help these patients. Hybrid closure of VS muscular VSTs will avoid 
cardiopulmonary bypass, avoids ventricular incisions, and does not uh, compromise the vascular access in these patients. So here is a patient who was 3.2 kilos, um, and you can see the ventricular septal defect. And um, what Dr. Malinari is a surgeon, he's excellent. And what we did was create a mini sternotomy. You take a look, you do it with echo, with, under echo guidance, TE guidance. And here you can see the wire going across. And once you get your wire across, you can have your sheath follow through. And once your sheath has followed through, um, you can then go ahead and here's a sheath going, the wire is there, the sheet's going there. Now the device is being loaded. And once the, that's loaded, you can advance it and under echo guidance, you can go ahead and deliver this muscular VSC device. I also find it uh, really nice to do this in older patients who have apical muscular VSTs, where the surgeon can sometimes tag the device to the surface so that it won't go loose in where the rim is very deficient. So closure of muscular VSTs with the Amplats and muscular VSD device at this point, I think is not limited by the patient's age or weight. The smallest that we have done is about 3.8 uh, to 3.2, I think 3.2. Uh, percutaneous was 3.8 and per ventricular was 3.2. Uh, again, the VSD size is not the limiting factor because you can use up to 14 millimeters, but you have to be careful with the size of the child, what size device you use. And I think there's a big role for this. One talk about uh, compound congenital heart disease, and this is the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. I think taking care of these patients with congenital heart disease is actually challenging and takes a whole team, which means you want your cardiac intensivist. Um, you know, Dr. Alma Javar is ours. And, um, you know, having your surgeon work with you in these hybrid approaches is where you are going to find the best results for your patients. So in the past, what we would do was put a shunt, you know, take, create the damus and reconnect everything here. Now what you can do is you can actually ban the pulmonary arteries, put a stent, across the PDA and then put a stent or do a good balloon septostomy of the atrium if you can um, and in, in select patients um, and um, you know wait for a while when you go to do the Glen, then you can take the risk of actually doing the damus. Children are a lot older by then and their neurological results will be better. So here's a patient with a hyperplastic left heart. You can see the band over there. You can see the stent placed uh, across the PDA and um, I thank you very much for inviting me. This is our team. Um, I think, if there are any questions, let me know. Thank you, Dr. Sandu, for that. Um, it's always amazing to see what where we are now with technology and digital printing and all these things that we can do and uh, uh, people were giving chances that before we might not. So we have a question from you from one of our attendees uh, and it reads, in your practice experience, what is the restenosis rate of the venous stents? Patents, so, sorry, it's compounded, but if you wanna answer that first part, part first. Yeah, so the venous stents can get, um, can get I, I think if you're looking at venous stenosis, I divide venous stenosis into two. One is discrete and one is long segment. So the discrete ones actually, um, for example, uh, which could be, Secondary to where you have surgery and you uh, transplant and you have uh, SVC, venous to venous anastomosis. If that suture line becomes narrow, that's very easy to balloon angioplasty and has significantly good results. In patients who have uh, venous stenosis, which is long segment, I think stents work better. I think the problem is patients who have clots because the clot will come through the stent. Covered stents have made it much easier to do that. In the patient that I showed the venous stent being placed, we'd actually put a covered stent and we are now about four months out and that, that patient has done very well so far. But again, once you have a clot there, you always wonder whether that clot will reappear. So you really want the covered stent to push all of it out. Uh, a regular uncovered stent will not work there. And I guess part of the answer to that includes her next question, uh, which is patency rates for these uh, venous stents. Yeah, so patency, you know, I, I think that about it's uh, for the stents is, I, I would say it's about 50% at best right now. But if you, 
if you see that the narrowing is reappearing, you can go and put another stent in it uh, if you want, um, but it depends. But 50% is what I would say for the venous stents right now. For, what, for the ones that have a for the ones that have a thrombus, the ones that there is no thrombus, it's actually really good at about eight ninety percent. Perfect. And on venous stents, still, what is your usual surveillance strategy? And do you use adjunctive antiplatelet therapy? So um, we do use um, I, we do use answering the second part. We do use plate, anti, uh, antiplatelet therapy over there. Um, and what was the first part of the question? I'm sorry. What is your usual surveillance strategy? So, you, you know, the echo is, uh, it, most of these patients get echoes to take a look at it. If that has a problem, then we do do imaging. I think for me, actually, the best one is to take a look and look at what the patient looks like. If they're having veins develop on them, physical exam, I think, and this is so much more important, especially in the in, in the SVC area, you start seeing veins develop, you start seeing some puffiness. Ask, um, we ask the mother, you know, when the child wakes up in the morning, is the face puffier than through the course of the day? And when you look at that and you start suspecting, and even if your echo is negative, I would get advanced imaging at that time to take a better look, such as ultrasound, which can sometimes also um, have its uh, challenges and um, CT or MRI at that point. And lastly, again, on venous stents, in the children as they grow, what is the natural history of the stents? Do you see migration, stenosis, et cetera? So my, if migration is going to occur in children, it's gonna happen right away. It's when you release the stent, which means that you miss, um, you, you didn't um, use the correct si diameter of the stent. As children grow, stenosis can occur even in well-placed discrete or you know, long segment narrowings, which had nothing to do with clots because child is growing and that area is not growing. I always recommend that you put a stent, unless it's an emergency, you put in a stent which can be dilated up to adulthood. So you can go back in then and dilate it up again. Perfect. Um, thank you, Dr. Sandhu. And we're gonna check to see if we have any further questions. But um, thank you for the amazing talk and for participating. And we're gonna move on to our last speaker now. So next we're gonna uh, welcome our local speaker, Dr. Christoph Kukula, who works at CTMH Doctors Hospital. He's gonna be presenting a case study, MVD in a diabetic lady with a ACS. So since 2019, we have been privileged here in Cayman Islands to receive uh, a doctor's hospital, Dr. Kukula, who uh, was tasked with organizing the cardiology and interventional cardiology service at this hospital. He quickly set up a comprehensive outpatient department with the basic services such as echocardiogram, holter, holter monitor, ABPM, stress testing, and also cardiac catheterization lab, which uh, is now functioning and did its uh, first primary PCI within months of institution in an acute MI patient, and it was successful. Dr. Kukula received his medical degree in the University Medical Faculty of Warsaw, Poland. Uh, he also received a PhD from the same institution. He completed a residency in internal medicine with specialist degree, as well as his cardiology with interventional cardiology specialty. So without further delay, here is Dr. Kukula from Doctors Hospital with a case study of MB, MVD in a diabetic lady with ACS. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of, the, uh, of this webinar of the Cayman Heart Fund for the uh, invitation. It's a great honor for me. Um, let me try and uh, share my screen with you. Um, all right, so I uh, decided to um, share with you a relatively simple case of an acute coronary syndrome patient uh, to illustrate the fact that despite uh, cardiology being arguably uh, the medical specialty where uh, we have guidelines, consensus statements, uh, and uh, uh, generally 
fixed treatments for almost everything. Uh, in everyday life, in relatively simple cases, we still encounter problems and there are still um, a lot of controversies about how to best treat our patients. Uh, this was a, a case I did a couple of years ago. Um, a 60-year-old lady with a history of chest pain at rest uh, with uh, a number of episodes lasting no longer than 30 minutes recurring over the last two days uh, and with a history of exertional chest pain uh, over the uh, preceding months as well. Uh, she was non-obese, uh, had hypertension. She had significant hyperglycemia on admission, but no prior diagnosis of diabetes. She was a smoker and otherwise she had no significant history. Uh, well, on admission, she still had chest pain. Um, she was KILIP1, so she was relatively uh, stable. She didn't have, um, uh, she didn't have uh, signs of acute heart failure, and she had some borderline inferior lead elevation, but generally around or less than one millimeter with inferior Q waves. Um, and this brings us to the first problem. Well, she certainly has a, an acute coronary syndrome, but actually she is just about halfway through, have, uh, halfway between having a STEMI and a non-STEMI. Uh, so she received clopidogrel, aspirin, and heparin prior to admission. Uh, her labs were uh, elevated, so she, her cardiac enzymes were, of course, elevated. Mm, no kidney failure. So this is her coronary angiography. That's the left coronary here. Um, what we can see, I'm not sure whether you can appreciate that, um, uh, on, on the streaming of the presentation, but if we stop this and move it back, we can see uh, diffuse severe calcifications along the course of the right coronary artery uh, and the left coronary artery into which we're injecting the contrast, into which I, I was injecting a contrast at the moment. Let's move back a little bit. You could probably see these calcifications here in the left coronary artery as well. So we can see uh, a tight narrowing, a tight lesion in the left coronary artery and actually diffuse disease in the LED. The left main is okay. And let's have a look at the right coronary artery. This is still another view of the left coronary artery showing a little bit better the calcium, I suppose. Uh, and let's move to the right coronary artery quickly. And the right coronary artery is a huge vessel with a lot of calcium, as you can see, and tight critical lesion right here in the distal segment of the artery. You can see it. Uh, let's, let's move this a little bit and you can probably see this best here right in the distal segment of the coronary artery. So generally, what treatment options do we have in case of this patient? Well, we can treat them, uh, we can treat her uh, either by, uh, well, she, she certainly needs treatment. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, an unequivocal thing. And we can treat her either by coronary artery bypass grafting or by PCI. If we consider that she has STEMI, she needs, uh, she needs uh, urgent emergent PCI. If we think this is a non-STEMI, then we can decide uh, and perhaps postpone treatment, discuss the case with a heart team, and perhaps uh, that would lead to coronary artery bypass grafting. Uh, this is a lady with an intermediate syntax score. Uh, and if we, if we look at her syntax 2020 score, which of course uh, two years ago was not available, but we can see that 
uh, that her um, her prognosis with PCI is actually um, a little bit inferior to uh, to CAVG. But of course, we have to take into the into account that the syntax score was not developed for for acute coronary syn syndrome patients specifically. So her Euroscore is high, both one and two relatively high. So uh, well. Our decision really rests on whether we decide that this is a STEMI or a non-STEMI. Uh, because of the heavy calcifications, we can expect this to be a technically challenging case. Um, because of her ECG, we think that the RCA, right coronary artery, is the culprit artery, but we, of course, have to appreciate that she has tight LAD lesions as well. And she has um, a small recessive uh, circumflex uh, artery, but also with some lesions in it. So the decision was uh, that it was actually an acute coronary syndrome, very close to being a STEMI. Uh, so uh, I decided to treat the RCA lesion uh, as the most probable culprit, culprit lesion uh, and uh, start not with upfront front ablation, but with a standard PCI technique. And then uh, as a second stage procedure, depending on, 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 on patient symptoms, uh, that could be postponed for some time or perhaps done um, relatively soon. Um, uh, the second stage would involve uh, doing the PCI of the LED uh, and perhaps the uh, circumflex, uh, which, would, which is a small artery, could be uh, deferred. So this is crossing the lesion with uh, balloons. A pre-dilating lesion, which, uh, as you can see, probably contains some thrombus and certainly contains a lot of calcium. And uh, a relatively infrequent occurrence right after implanting a stent into this RCA, I could actually see a proximal dissection going uh, retrogradely uh, along the wall of the RCA. And you can see here uh, the RCA dissecting over a very long segment you know, from the distal segment to the proximal one. Well, in this situation, there is really nothing much we can do apart from continuing to stent the artery. So I continued with placement of subsequent stents, achieving finally uh, a good final result with a good flow. But of course, uh, that was not the original intention to stent the whole RCA. Uh, let me just give you a quick reminder uh, of how the LED looked like. Those were the lesions in the LED. Um, uh, I, well, actually, several several weeks after the first stage of the procedure, we readmitted the patient, uh, and uh, we were sort of ready to uh, do rotational atherectomy of the LED. Um, uh, because of the calcifications, but uh, we did start with attempting to cross the lesion with a 0.5 millimeter balloon that was unsuccessful. Therefore, uh, we did rotablation. You can see the rota wire here. We did a rotablation rotational atherectomy of the uh, of the uh, LAD uh, with subsequent placement of a long stent. Just to remind you, I, unfortunately, I haven't recorded the actually passage, the actual passage of the uh, of the uh, 
of the burr through that uh, LED. So just to remind you how this looks like, this is another, uh, another artery, another case, uh, a burr in the proximal part of the RCA passing through calcifications, through osteal calcification. So, so that's the uh, rotational atherectomy burr. That's the only purpose of this slide to show how this looks. Uh, and after placing that stand, after post dilating, this is the final result of the LED, which seems perfectly acceptable. Uh, we, since uh, the since the uh, circumflex was a small artery, we decided to uh, defer uh, the treatment of the left uh, circumflex to see whether the patient is going to have symptoms or not. And over the next, uh, over the next uh, months, the patient remained asymptomatic. Her ejection fraction was 60% with a, a limited uh, limited uh, akinasia of the basal segment of the inferior wall and hypokinetic middle segment. Uh, she had a negative stress test, good exercise capacity. So we decided to treat her conservatively in terms of the of her circumflex. And at uh, at almost two years, the patient remains stable uh, without uh, any evidence of angina. Uh, so this certainly was a patient which may have been treated, treated differently, uh, perhaps with the same or a better effect, perhaps with less risk. Uh, so, so this is a matter of discussion. So despite all the guidelines um, uh, which we have, we sometimes still have to make a quick decision, especially in terms of acute coronary syndrome patients, um, uh, which uh, may, uh, of course, uh, decide on their clinical course. We don't always have time to ponder. Uh, sometimes the decisions have to be taken during the night uh, and without access to the full armament, uh, which would may aid in uh, the decision-making process. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kukula. And we certainly feel very privileged um, in Cayman to have uh, specialists such as yourself and, uh, this, and this other cath lab at Doctors Hospital that can provide interventions such as this to our population. Um, one of the questions uh, is, in this particular case, after the right coronary was done successfully, and then you brought back the patient for PCI of the LAD, was there discussion uh, in between those procedures and involvement of cardiac surgery to see if other modalities would have benefited the patient, and what made you finally decide for PCI at a later date for the LAD? Uh, yes, certainly uh, there was a discussion with the cardiac surgeons. Uh, well, the consensus was after the discussion uh, that since the patient was treated already with stenting successfully, um, and uh, since there was no left main involvement, uh, that uh, uh, another PCI of the LAD with possible rotational atherectomy um, uh, may probably be a less invasive and equally uh, effective treatment modality. Uh, also, the patient was not a particular enthusiast of um, coronary artery bypass grafting, uh, but uh, of course that uh, must not always lead our decisions. Great. Um, in cases where there is no MI, non-ST or ST elevation, patients only have stable angina or other that led to uh, diagnosis, the heavy calcification you witnessed in this case, would that, would that have swayed you in a different direction without the MI? Uh, well, yes, certainly. This, this is an option. Uh, when you see diffuse heavy calcifications like this, um, you do tend to consider uh, coronary ar artery bypass grafting uh, much more easily. It also depends on the, cen on, on the center's experience uh, 
with treating diffuse calcifications in the coronaries, um, there are now more and more modalities effective in, in, in treating this. There is, uh, um, there is uh, orbital atherectomy, there is rotational atherectomy with new equipment coming up. Uh, there is also, um, uh, there is also uh, the shockwave system, um, which uh, enables us to uh, crack the coronary calcium uh, similarly to uh, what uh, had previously been done in peripheral blood vessels or actually in the kidneys, in case of kidney stones, with, uh, with uh, uh, shockwave emission. Great. Uh, perhaps you don't have this information, but in this particular case, or you don't recall, uh, it seems to be a very common case that us in primary care and preventative medicine see 60 something year old lady with no previous history, even though they carry diabetes but wasn't diagnosed. Do you have any information in that case or similar cases of symptoms, prodromal symptoms in patients such as her that would have uh, led the primary care doctors to maybe investigate before she had the actual MI? Uh, yes, well, certainly this lady had exertional an angina for some months uh, preceding this acute presentation. Uh, so she certainly could have been, uh, could have been uh, directed for treatment or diagnosed sooner um, had she uh, reported to, uh, to her primary care physician. I'm not sure whether she did or not, and, and she was mi misdiagnosed or not diagnosed, or she simply did not uh, see her primary care physician. Uh, we all also often say that uh, in diabetic patients, uh, chest pain may not be as prevalent a symptom um, as in other patients, uh, which of course may be the case, uh, but uh, often uh, patients have some, um, some symptoms which could be equivalent to, to, to classical angina. And if we ask them about this uh, specifically, we can usually pick up some abnormalities which can lead uh, to full diagnosis. Um, and lastly, it's not really a question, but somebody from the panel just wanted you to know that they found the presentation very honest and they appreciated the discussion a lot. So I wanted to also echo that sentiment and say that we appreciate this uh, discussion. It was a very relevant case, probably a case we see often in uh, primary care. And thank you for sharing that with us. And again, that was Dr. Kukula from Doctors Hospital, where we now have PCI available amongst other modalities of cardiovascular medicine. Thank you very much. So I want to thank everybody for joining in, and I want to especially thank our speakers and the hospitals who supported us. This has been an incredible evening of learning, and we hope that all of you have enjoyed it. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this event was awarded 3.5 CME credits by the CIMDS, and in order to claim those credits, please follow the link in the email that will be sent after this live webinar to then download your certificate. I would like to also mention that the Heart Fund, especially given this is our first uh, virtual webinar, would welcome your feedback greatly. So if you could please access the survey link in the browser when the webinar ends or click the link in the follow-up follow email that will be sent to you 24 hours after this webinar and let us know what you thought about the presentation and any other comments that you have. Lastly, the Cayman Heart Fund offers educational events such as this one at no cost to the attendees. And our sole motive is to educate and create awareness of cardiovascular disease. That having, uh, having said that, we, we are a charitable organization and donations are always welcome. And if you or anyone wish to donate to our cause, please visit us at caymanheartfund.ky and click the donate now button to go to our page at Cayman Gift Certificate. When you donate through that site, 100% of what you donate comes to the Cayman Heart Fund. And we do not only look for uh, financial donations, also through our website, email, and other modes of uh, communication, social media, and such. We look always eager to find volunteers. So please uh, take consideration into that and help us out to continue to provide cardiovascular disease prevention and aid here in the Cayman Islands. Again, I wanted to thank all the speakers, uh, 
the staff, the volunteers, everybody who supported us, and all of you to, uh, for coming in and watching this webinar going into the evening. I wish everybody a good evening and thank you for having joined us.